Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts for today, John DeLynn. I am excited to have Riding Shotgun for today. Back in the house, Samantha Shelley of Zelf on the Shelf. Hey, Samantha. Hello, John. How are you doing? Doing well. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you. You are excited for today's episode. I am, yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah, you're a fan. For those of you who don't know, today we are interviewing... Um, a really cool couple. We're interviewing Tommy and Madison Johnson. Hey, Madison and Tommy, how are you guys doing? Good, doing how well. are you? Yeah? Yeah. So um, some of you will know or recognize Tommy's face. Uh, Tommy is uh, a Mormon TikToker and Instagrammer. He is known as the Tomsters on both TikTok and Instagram. And he's a comedian and uh, we are here to talk about his Mormon story, but his amazing partner, Madison, is also here. And I am always elated when we can have, when there is a couple, when we can have both join. Um, there's going to be a lot we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about their, their Mormon story growing up in the church, uh, different things that they faced uh, as Mormons, what they loved about the church, if there were any struggles. But then we're going to talk about um, their faith journeys. Madison, uh, well, their their families had faith journeys, their parents and and so forth, siblings maybe, uh, but also um, Madison had her own faith journey that might have been a little bit uh, ahead of Tommy's, uh, but then Tommy had his own, and there is going to be some mixed faith marriage themes in here as well, and um, and probably just full on faith crisis stuff, and creating in kind of a social media world, kind of in the social media Mormon world. Now, those are those are some of the major highlights of what this story is going to touch on. What am I forgetting, Madison and Tommy? I think you covered it pretty yeah? well. Yeah. yeah, that's a good yeah. list, yeah. How are you guys feeling about being on Mormon Stories? Good. I know, I mean, there's a point where uh, people said, like, hey, you should go on, and I think I told them, there's no chance. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm sure they're surprised. Um, and I'm surprised that we're here in the grand scheme of things. But today I'm excited to be here. Okay. Yeah. Madison, anything yeah. to add? Um, I'm excited to be here. I definitely did not ever think I would be here. I don't have a follow following. Um, I'm just Tommy's wife. No. I'm not just Tommy's <laughs> no, no, no. wife, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm excited to be here. All right. Samantha, anything you want to say before we jump in? Nope, I'm also just excited to be here. All right, well, let's do it. So, uh, who who's older? I am. Tommy. All right, so let's begin with Tommy. Okay. Where does your Mormon story begin? All right, so uh, bare basics. Um, I was born here in Utah, um, Spanish Fork. Well, technically Orem, but we lived in Spanish Fork. Um, Back in 1995, you know, year, years ago now. <laughs> um, and uh, I was, uh, at the time, the second of two kids, but there's um, five kids now. Um, but, yeah, so we, we spent four years in Spanish Fork. Um, Were your parents uh, kind of pioneer stock Mormons or converts? Or uh, yes. Something in between? Uh, so, yeah, pioneer stock uh, Mormons. Um, I only hesitate because my mom uh, was adopted, um, but like her adoptive family, um, her 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 dad was uh, technically a convert, but looking into his own family history, found a lot of pioneer uh, history there. Um, they they are from Idaho. My parents' family, or my mom's family, and my dad's family comes from Utah and Wyoming. So a lot of um, family history stories of great 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 grandma uh great 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 grandpa came over to the Salt Lake Valley um that's kind of a lot of our family history is people coming over from Europe to join uh, the saints in Salt Lake so that's okay yeah so right. yeah um and just a little bit about my parents as well they um they met at BYU uh in the Wilkinson Center do you know what year uh, 1988. So your parents and I were at BYU at the same time. There you go. I got off my mission in 88. Okay. No, 
I got off my mission in 90, but I started at BYU in 87. Okay. So I'm, I'm probably the same age as your parents. Basically, probably. Which makes me feel what? Awesome. I feel awesome. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Just, <laughs> just great. Um, but yeah, so I actually, so we, and this, this is a fun thing. So their first date was at uh, the, the training table. Um, on December 3rd, 1988. And I know that because um, uh, before the training table went out of business and apparently they're coming back in some yeah, respect, I saw right? There's they have some. the best fry sauce. I mean, Utah is known for its fry sauce. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you like fry sauce, Samantha? Yeah. Yeah. Training table had the best fry sauce. Yeah. And it's they made cheese fries. So you dip the cheese fries in the, it's just life changing. Yeah. yeah. With the and you would, you would order by a little telephone, yeah. a little phone at the table. <laughs> so we would we would celebrate their first date. We called it their first date anniversary, and we would go to training table as a family and just kind of celebrate fun their first date. Um, so this yeah. episode is brought to you by training table. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, yeah. Good promo, John. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so yeah, so they so in terms of just kind of their kind of what I was born into was very much um, the plan of like. You meet at BYU, you get married, and you start having kids. And that's kind of what the product of, that's me, and the product of that plan. Um, So, yeah, so they, uh, yeah, we were in Spanish Fork for about four years. Then we moved to Illinois. Um, My dad got a job um, out there. And for me, so I was there from ages four to ten. So a lot of um, pretty, like, crucial grown-up stuff happened there. Um, but for me, it was really eye opening to be in a place where, um, I was the like religious minority, um, in our little schools, the only members were like my siblings and like maybe one other family. And so, um, I learned very quickly that being a Mormon was not the norm. Um, and, and the idea of kind of being a peculiar people and kind of being, um, yeah, just not the crowd f- favorite uh, was kind of my role a little bit. That was kind of my burden to bear. Um, and then even just being in Illinois, um, you know, the historical relationship between Illinois and Mormonism, uh, not the greatest in the Mormon light uh, with, you know, Nauvoo and whatnot. And when, when we were living there, um, the Nauvoo Temple was being built and built. And so that was a big deal for all the Illinois saints. We went down to Nauvoo and saw President Hinckley speak. Uh, that was the first temple I ever set foot in was the Nauvoo Temple through the open house. Um, really cool as a kid. kind of felt, you know, castle-like. And um, the Nauvoo Temple is, I mean, it's based off of the original one, which is a older pioneer, obviously pre-pioneer type temple. So just... Um, Really neat, and and in Navu they've got um, uh, little sites where you know you you make a candle, you make rope, you do all kind of this. You churn butter. You churn. Well, I don't. Maybe I think you can. Well, blow glass. Yeah. Yeah, all sorts <laughs> of that kind of stuff. Of like, this is what the pioneers did, or, or the saints in Illinois did, um, the Navu pageant, um, and so though we were, um, you know, kind of a religious minority where we lived and. Uh, Peoria, Illinois, uh, we would take trips down to Nauvoo and kind of felt like home a little bit, like, okay, these are our people. Um, and so there was still a connection there to the whole Mormon, kind of like, okay, this is where we were. I remember my mom was a, a our scout master. That was her calling, um, or cub leader or something. Um, and we went to the grave of whoever, kind of the governor who... Ford? I, don't, I can't remember, but just not great vibes with the Mormons. And we just saw <laughs> it. He's Thomas Ford. And yeah, he was the I, governor of Illinois when everything went bad. Okay, yeah. And yeah. we went and we just kind of, we saw him. And I, we didn't stomp on his grave or spit or anything, <laughs> but we just kind of saw him and kind of like, all right, this is kind of, because uh, of course the code um, group was, or the scout group was through the church. And so we're all LDS in this little group. Yeah, I'll have to ask her why we went. Maybe just to, I don't know, shake a fist or something, but. <laughs> We saw him, and it was all just kind of um, experiencing our Mormonism through kind of the ties that were there in Illinois. Yeah, I just have to say, like, every major world religion has kind of its sacred sites. Like, mm-hmm. Islam has, you know, Mecca and Medina. 
you know, obviously Judaism has Jerusalem and Nauvoo along with like Palmyra, Mm -hmm. Nauvoo, Illinois, Carthage, Illinois, Carthage, Illinois, Palmyra, New York, kind of Independence, Missouri, although we're kind of trying to hide that now a little bit. Like these are some of the sacred sites along with Salt Lake, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. You bring up Carthage too, because that's not obviously too far from Nauvoo. Um, And we visited the jail a number of times and went into the different rooms and they play a little reenactment of the, of uh, just just kind of tell a story. And there's what, what story for those who don't know. Oh yeah. Of uh, Joseph Smith's martyrdom and Hiram Smith's martyrdom or murder, you know, whatever word you want to use, but they died (laughs) uh, at that time. Uh, Most people believe, you know, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But that, yeah, that's the place known for Joseph and Hiram's last moments and days. Um, And so, yeah, and and, and they point out like, this is the bullet, you know, a bullet hole came through here and, and they came up through here and they were dressed up like this and it's all, and you're in that room and like, it was in this room where their last moments were. So as a kid, again, I'm, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old that's just wild stuff to, to be in the room where the, uh, the, the founding prophet, uh, was killed in was, um, quite the experience. Um, and so, um, again, those ages there, I was baptized there in Illinois. Um, um, and, um, I don't remember a ton of my baptism, I remember being very excited to be perfect for at least a minute or two coming out of the water. Like, okay, I've got, I've got at least, I got to like try to be at least like 10 minutes perfect before, I don't know, maybe I think a mean thought or annoy my sister or something. I was very <coughs> excited, looking forward to being perfect for a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, I mean, a, a pretty, I, I would say growing up Mormon, it was pretty standard uh, run of the mill. Although we were in Illinois, very um, kind of. I mean, we were Utah created Mormons. We were, you know, so we brought that out to Illinois with us. Um, family home evening every Monday. Um, you know, we were at church every Sunday. I remember uh, on one Sunday faking sick so I could watch my first NFL game because um, I was a big sports fan. Bears. No, well, it was just whatever was on TV. So I just, I remember it was a Colts game. I got to watch Peyton Manning. I was really excited. I stayed home. Uh, we had a dog at the time. And I remember just holding her, feeling very proud of myself. Like, we we did it. <laughs> we're here. We're watching an NFL game. Um, and I didn't feel, I don't remember feeling bad about it. But that's just kind of the, that those were the steps that it took to watch an NFL game in my family's home was, uh, you know, faking sick and making sure I turn the channel so you can hit like that last watch button to <laughs> make sure. Wow, covering um, your tracks. Well, yeah, because I knew like because we were, uh, you know, like a, a no TV, no uh, radio, no electronics on Sunday type of family. So um, <laughs> I, I knew what I had to do to make it look like I didn't do anything. Um but yeah, pretty pretty traditional. Um, I wouldn't say like anything overly crazy in terms of rules or whatever, but um, anything that was you know kind of set over the pulpit to us at that time, just kind of follow, and that was the expectation was to be a, a, a faithful Mormon. Okay, so pretty like not crazy Orthodox, but but an observant, devout Mormon family. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In to- total siblings in total? Yeah, so I, I have four siblings. There's five of us. Okay, biggish. Yeah, um, I'm the second of five. Mm-hmm. Um, we So my, my the, the first three of us were born um, within three years of each other. Oh. And then my parents took a break <coughs> for obvious reasons. Um, and then the last two came along uh, seven and ten years later. Okay. Mm. Oh, maybe a little uh, by, uh, seven and ten years after me. So okay, um, but yeah, so six and nine years later. Okay, um, but yeah, it's a bit of a gap. Yeah, we call them the bigs and the littles growing up. Like the bigs can stay up, but the littles have to go to bed. <laughs> that kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, there's five of us. When the when the littles get big, do they get tired of being referred to as the littles? We haven't called them the littles in a while. <laughs> okay. I might have to bring that up. Uh, 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 they do upcoming. still call their little brother. 
a little, okay. but he's like 17. <laughs> yeah, he's a senior in high But he's school. the only one. Okay. Yeah. So. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So um, do you remember going to church as a kid and how you felt the church? And Yeah. So I remember going to church. We, um, uh, My dad was a bishop out in Illinois. Um, Bishop's son. Yeah. And so we had the missionaries over often. Always loved that as a kid. Um, they were cool in my eye. Um, and a lot of them were from out here. And that and my, and my so my grandparents were still out here. Uh, one set in Idaho, one set in Utah. And so we would come out here and visit. And I thought Utah was just pretty cool. I mean, that's where my grandparents were. And it was a place that we vacationed often to come see them. And so just to have people um, in our home that were from there, that was pretty neat to me as a kid. Um, but yeah, going to church, I uh, only remember positive feelings. Um, and also, I, I definitely, I, so I, I have one memory of um, uh, growing up in our, in our neighborhood. There's this kind of this long street that we lived on, and we were friends with a, a girl up the street. And at one point, she mentioned that she she went to a church. And I don't remember what church, but I remember letting her know that it was the wrong church, whatever church she was at, and that we were the true church. And I remember my mom pulling me aside saying that saying that wasn't very kind. And I remember being a little confused, being like, well, that's what I learn every Sunday, is that we're the one true church and that we should be kind of letting people know about it. Um, but so I kind of I, I took her, her words to be like, don't do it like that. Be nicer about it. Because I, I, I was straight up kind of like, okay, that's cool, but, like, you're doing it wrong was kind of the, the message. I just I was just trying to save souls, you know. I was just doing yeah. my best. Um, and, again, I was eight, nine years old or whatever. So, um, but, I mean, because I was baptized a member, so, I, you know, got to go, uh, you know, from day one, kind of tr- bring people in. Um, but, yeah, so I, I, I only have positive memories uh, really, um, from church going there. Any um, favorite primary songs? I have to ask that question. Yeah. Um, a child's prayer is always a, a, a favorite. Um, uh, honestly, I just really liked all of the singing time. Mm-hmm. Just, that was my favorite part of Sunday was being able to, to sing. So, okay. um, but a child's prayer sticks out. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So once you start moving into your adolescent years, um, yeah, talk about kind of middle school, high school, and anything that's kind of interesting for your Mormon story. Okay. So uh, when I was 10, we moved back to Utah, um, and that's where my family's been ever since. And I remember, so I we came back when I was in the fifth grade. Um, and on the first day of fifth grade, um, I'm in I'm in Cedar Hills, Utah, just the middle of Utah Valley, but I don't understand that as a ten year old, and I um, I go to class the first day of school, and my teacher is just telling us about herself, and she mentions that she graduated from BYU, and in my head I was like, oh my goodness, she might be a Mormon, just like <laughs> just like me, because all I had ever known was being uh, the only Mormon in my class. And so she told us about herself, and she opened up um, discussion for any questions. And I gathered all the courage <laughs> in my little 10-year-old body and rose my hand, and, and I asked her, are you Mormon? And she said, she kind of laughed, and she said yes. Um, and everyone else kind of laughed, too. And I realized, I think we're all Mormon. <laughs> and that was the best news for me <laughs> as a 10-year-old um, for a couple of reasons. One... Maybe I'm off the hook now for missionary, you know, opportunities because I didn't go so well the first time. Uh, but also, I just felt like, oh, now everyone will know what I'm, what I, what I know. This is great, and I just, I, I was excited about it. Hmm. Um, and so, um, growing up, um, you know, through middle school and high school, um, just did all the normal uh, boy stuff, meaning uh, church stuff, meaning twelve year old. 12 years old, um, become a deacon, in the ironic priesthood. 14, become a teacher. 16, become a priest. All the stuff. Boy Scouts? Yep, Eagle Scout. By the time you were? Like the day before I was 18. Oh, okay. Yeah. So 
So we weren't well, a bit of yeah. an underachiever. I'm kidding. Yeah, no, I was. I slept right in there. <laughs> I uh, never got my eagle, so uh, I'm the well. Well, there's some people, right? That you know, the rule is a family rule of like before you can get a driver's license or whatever it might be. Uh, I'm very grateful I wasn't, you know, my type of situation, or I wouldn't have been able to drive probably until the day before I was 18. Um, uh, but yeah, so yeah, all th- you know, scouting um, did that, um, and when I was a um, I just started my senior year. It was 2012. Um, was that, you know, August, September. And then October conference, 2012, was when the mission age changed. Mm. And so that was a, a huge deal um, because I was right. I was about to turn 18 and graduate high school. Um, and I remember uh, hearing that and feeling very uh, confident that I – something in my head was like you're going at 18 and I uh took that as the spirit being like this is your plan and I was like okay and um President Monson was Thomas S. Monson was the prophet at the time and I'd always had a connection with him I really liked him but also we share a name on purpose Tommy's I was named after him oh yeah so that was premeditated twinning uh (laughs) and so um so yeah, I always really liked him, um, and so just just hearing it from him, and it was just all kind of this kind of perfect storm of like this is awesome, like this is cool, the hasting of the work of salvation, I get to be a part of it, and also in a practical sense, my older brother um, at the time was in college, and he we we had just planned we were all just going to serve, uh, you know, missions, and we were going to overlap each other and we wouldn't see each other for four years but now with the age change it was just going to be three years so i was like practically excited and spiritually excited it was all just good news um and so um one thing i want to add in here because it'll it'll play a role um um in in the larger mormon story my mormon story um family is just a big deal for my family we're all very close and at some point, um, we we spent a family home evening, and this was back in Illinois. We spent a family home evening. I, it may have been a direction of a, a, a church leader or something, or it may have just been a, my parents' idea. I don't know. But we created a family motto that we would end up um, reciting after every family prayer for the rest of my forever, just being a, in our family. And we took the last... Our, the letters of our last name and just made a little motto. So our last name is Johnson. So to start off with J, joyful, obedient, honest, not afraid to try, service on the same team, no empty chairs was the last one. Service on the same team? Yeah. No empty chairs. No empty chairs. <clears throat> I'm writing these down. Okay. And we would repeat that after every every family prayer. Um, it, and it felt a little bit like a little huddle like say team on three, one, two, three, team break or whatever. That was the vibe of it was like, this is our family. These are our family values. These are our family goals. And one, two, three break. And it was just repeated and recited. And um, for me that it it just instilled in me like uh, the value of family. Yeah. Um, but also in there, and I just want to break this down. So I feel like most of those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, but the last one, no empty chairs. Yeah. So no empty chairs is, is a, a saying um, I'm sure mo- a lot of Mormons are familiar with. The idea is um, in the celestial kingdom, so the highest degree of heaven that a Mormon can, can achieve, um, you, you have to do certain things to get there. You have to... Um, just basically be a, a, a faithful Mormon. Follow the commandments, live up to your covenants, um, participate in ordinances and whatnot. And the only, and the teaching as well is the only way that a family can be forever is if you're in the cel- celestial kingdom. If there's stragglers and a lower heaven, that just kind of s- stinks for everyone. And so the idea is no empty chairs, for us, there are seven people in our family, so we just thought of um, figurative seven chairs in a circle in the celestial kingdom, 
We don't want a single empty one. So our family goal is to be faithful Mormons, basically. So just kind of trim it down. That's what the goal is, was to be faithful members of the church so we can be a family forever. We don't want a single missing chair. We don't want, you know, Claire gone. That's my sister. We don't want this, oh, where's Claire? You know, there's six out of seven. We want all the chairs full. Because in Mormonism, families can be together forever if they all follow the devout Mormon path. Exactly. Otherwise, it's six family members in the celestial kingdom with one in the telestial, the terrestrial kingdom, and they can't hang out with you guys. Mm -mm. I guess in Mormonism, technically, you can go visit that person. You can go down and visit them for a little while, but there must be some sort of time limit, and then you got to go back, and then they're left without their family. Yes. In heaven. Mm -hmm. Forever. For Forever eternity, and ever. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of an intense teaching. V very <laughs> much in that. Very intense. I mean, it's, I, I imagine as a kid, you're like, this is going to be great. We're all going to be in the celestial kingdom together, right? Exactly. Like, what's well, wrong with that? Yeah, because, you know, my perspective was we we figured it out. Like, we'll be one of the few families uh, that will be forever. You know, the gate, narrow the way. Exactly. And we, be, we, find it. Yeah, we have the fullness of the truth. Yeah. Um, and so we were very blessed to know about this whole no empty chairs kind of plan. And so, um, and so that just kind of mantra, that whole, that family motto, um, uh, made family just super important to me. Um, and so, yeah, so going back to, um, October, 2012, the mission age changed and I, I had no serving a mission for me was, uh, no brainer there was no there was there was nothing that wasn't going to stop me from going now it was just kind of when 18 or 19 and I felt pretty quickly like okay I'm gonna go at 18 and so I was in the first group of like high school graduates that went out on a mission um, I got my mission call when I was still 17 years old uh, which is crazy to me I'm like that's a child um but I was so excited, and and I, I never said this in a prayer because I felt like this would be sacrilegious. But I very much in my head was like, there are, are like five scenarios where I think I will serve a happy mission, like five locations, and all the rest I think I will not do a good job because of just fears that I have. And so for me, I was like, I want to be, these are some selfish things. I said, I want to go foreign because that's cool, but I want to speak English, because that's easy, and so for me, I had, it was either Canada, uh, England, Australia, or like South Africa, those were like it, from what I understood at the time. Not was, New Zealand. Not, yeah, see, there's, <laughs> the, the, I didn't even understand about <laughs> New Zealand. Geographical yeah, knowledge. <laughs> yeah, um, and so for me, that those were like, that's all that's available for yeah. me, and then again, I didn't pray and ask for that because I would be like bad to be like, <laughs> I will go where you want me to go, asterisk. As long as it's those five. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, four or five. Um, but very much in my heart, I was like, I, these are the only places. Because I didn't want to learn a language, so I just thought I would be bad at it. And I didn't want to go anywhere too tropical because, again, limited understanding. I was like, there's probably big bugs and <laughs> like limited showering and stuff. And so... More I just, gross. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, so that was, again, that's my 17-year-old self being like, if I'm going to go somewhere for two years, I have some yeah. some thoughts. We're all um, dying to know where you got called. Yeah, Canada. I went to Canada. Oh, really? Yeah, it worked out. Um, so I went Which to... Which mission? Uh, Winnipeg. Okay. So it's um, for all the can uh, Canada buffs out there. It's <laughs> all of Saskatchewan and all of Manitoba and parts of Ontario. Is that kind of like Siberia, like super cold, tundra-like places or not? Uh, yes, but the coldest and like most unbearable places, people, we weren't there. Okay. We were close to the border, of uh, the U.S.-Canada border. But, I mean, it got down to like minus 40. Yeah. Oh my it gosh. was really cold. And then Although I remember Chicago getting to minus 30 when I lived there. So yeah. It, probably weather-wise, oh, well, I guess I don't know how much you would have remembered Chicago as a kid. So I, I, I did feel a little prepared of like okay there's just some days where it's impossible to be warm yeah that's just not an option yeah um and so i um yeah i got my mission call 
um, and I left to the MTC a week and a half after I graduated high school. Oh, wow. Which for me, I just thought was awesome. Mm-hmm. I was like, let's just get this ball rolling. And serving a mission for me was, uh, there are a lot of good parts for it, like going on a mission. One, I did want to spread the gospel. I felt like I had um, ex- personal experiences with the atonement of Jesus Christ, and I wanted to share that happiness with other people. I felt like I had had legitimate experiences, and I was excited about that. Um, also, I'm a just innately, I'm a big kind of like legacy person. So the fact that my dad had served, um, his dad had served, my brother was currently serving, I was just super excited to be another Elder Johnson in the line of Elder Johnsons. That was just a big deal to me for whatever reason. Um, so I was excited to 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 be. Um, <coughs> In the MTC, I was there just for two weeks because I was speaking English. Um, and then, yeah, flew up to Canada. Let me ask, um, I want to pause before you tell your mission story okay. and jump back to Madison. But before we do, like, I always like to know whether kind of in your high school years, mm. you like had this moment where it's like, okay, I know that I'm Mormon, probably in part because my parents are Mormon but we've got the saying within Mormonism, you can't live on borrowed light, which means at some point you can't rely on the testimony of your parents and your family. You got to get in your own testimony, go to seminary and all that stuff. You would have gone to seminary as a part of your high school experience. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, like I heard about Moroni's promise in the book of Mormon and wanting to pray to know for myself if the church was true. That's just a setup kind of to tee up the formation of your testimony and its status by the time you're going on a mission. Yeah. Um, it's a good question and I am going to answer it. And I didn't coming in. I wasn't sure if I was going to share this part of my story. Um, but in this moment, I feel like I want to, so I'm going to, um, so yes, I did have that experience and it, and it came out of, um, a personal, uh, what I would call like a legitimate struggle with, uh, pornography use, um, I'll, I'll tell the story because I think it is kind of funny of how it all kind of started. Just It went back to Illinois. I was in the fourth grade. Um, we we're having some sort of school or class party or something. I'm in the circle of kids. And this kid tells us of a website um, where there are inappropriate images online. And my first thought is there's no way that's illegal. <laughs> that is literally against the law that uh, that, that would even be allowed. Um, and so when I got home... Um, I searched for that website, and he was right. It was not against the law, um, but I felt absolutely horrible. And in context, I was either 9 or 10 years old, so just pretty freshly baptized, and that was where my first thought went. The first time I saw anything inappropriate, I was like, I've screwed this up. Wrecked your baptism. Period. I'm done, yeah. <clears throat> and again, I'm, I'm 10 years old, and I think I've ruined no empty chairs already oh um and it it hit me hard um and to to summarize i didn't tell anyone about any of my experiences with pornography from that time to when i was 17 years old so for like seven years and some really important um just human development years i think i'm a pretty bad guy um, because of what I've done. Um, and I felt pretty, res- I felt responsible for, again, being the empty chair. Because for what I understood, everyone else in my family was living up to their promise to, every, to, to us every time we repeated that mantra. But I secretly kind of hated it. So I was like, no empty chairs except for me. Like in my head, I would think stuff like that. That's a heavy weight. Yeah, it was huge, and I, you know, it was, um, and I, and I internalized that because of, you know, stuff that I was learning, <clears throat> excuse me, learning at church, you know, um, about worthiness and the law of chastity, and and that whole time. So this is like two thousand and five to two thousand and twelve, and so church leaders, especially at the the top of the chain, like general conference and stuff the language around, like, the internet and digital stuff and internet pornography and stuff was very, uh, it just, 
I felt like it was someone who, you know, people that didn't really know the internet talking about the internet and just kind of um, digital pornography. And so I, I remember, and I, I didn't, again, I wasn't planning on talking about it, so I didn't bring the exact quote, but I remember listening to a John By the Way talk where he referenced President Hinckley. And there was a quote that, in summary, was like, who, what, it was talking to the young men, is that like a priesthood session? And he was saying, like, young men, think about these young women that you're eventually going to, like, court and date and marry. Um, who among them would want to date someone who's looked at pornography? Mm-hmm. So just don't even look at it. That was kind of the messaging I was getting was mm-hmm. don't even start because once you start, <clears throat> all hell breaks loose and you can't even stop it. And I was entering this already had starting. So I was hearing these messaging like these messages like, oh, wow, I've already failed. Like I've ar- like there's no redemption. Mm-hmm. They're telling me not to start. I've already started. It's, it's, uh, I can't go back. So, you know, it's kind of, I've already failed that. How did you go from that first? Because the first time it sounds like it wasn't your fault at all. You just, you didn't even think it was going to happen. And then you felt a lot of guilt. That what, what made you go back the second time? Was it like that belief that you're already done for? Um, I think honestly, it was more just like childhood curiosity. Just, um, just, uh, I was going through probably early uh, moments of pu- puberty and just was uh, caught those feelings of like, oh, you know, what's this? Um, and just kind of going after that. I do also feel like there was a definite like, I'm, you know, I've already ruined it. So what's the point of trying to not do it because the black mark's already there. Like I've already, the, the crimson has already infected the sheep's white cloth or wh- yeah. whatever like it's already done and and it was so confusing as a kid because i would hear of this all powerful jesus that would wash away all of your sins while also so that that's like a lot of first hour stuff like sacrament meeting stuff of like jesus will you know and but then in these break off classes in second and third hour of like we'll never view pornography because once you do it's damaged just there. Goods. You're damaged yeah. goods. So I'm like, okay, well, then what the heck? Jesus is like almost pa- all powerful. <laughs> it's just the whole porn thing. He didn't figure that out. Like, <laughs> missed that atonement you know, moment. I don't know. And and I don't mean to speak ill, but just as a kid, I was so confused, especially the older I got, because there were more and more when I was a young man or whatever. It seemed like there's a lot of pornography lessons. And I hated those because, again, the messaging was either you're already. You, yeah, it's already too late. Or every once in a while, we would watch the Ted Bundy video, and I'm going to be a serial killer one day. So my two <laughs> options. Every once in a while, the Ted yeah. Bundy video. So I was, Wait, what is the Ted Bundy okay, video yeah, should, that you're watching in church? I should explain. So there was, <laughs> not, I don't honestly, I don't even know if it's church produced or whatever, but there. It's not. It's okay. just an, it's an interview. Yeah. yeah. I just uh, There's a little snippet that's shared, and I don't know if it was pulled or whatever, but. There's a trend, and I've talked to other people, and they've seen the same video in church settings. So I know it's not a one-off thing. But in Ted Bundy's, like, final interview, or one of his final interviews, he talks about how all the bad guys that he's with in prison, it all started, all their evil doing started by viewing pornography. And it got worse and worse and worse, and now they're killing people. (laughs) And that was shown in the spirit of don't watch porn because you might become Ted Bundy. <laughs> and I thought that was my lot in life was either to become Ted Bundy <laughs> or <laughs> or do enough good to like steer myself away from the like that's that's already going to happen but like do my best to not become Ted Bundy. <laughs> like those were the two options was either become Ted Bundy <laughs> or like live my whole life <laughs> trying not to become Ted Bundy. And that was because, and here's the thing too, my mindset was I want to be the best person I can be, which I understood at that time was to be the best Mormon I could be. And so I felt like I always had a a scarlet letter that was blind to, like no one else saw it, only I saw it and God saw it and was like, "Mm." Mm. Um, but I, I just wanted to do good. And so I, I, I internalized all this shame because I was like, Oh, 
I just can't overcome this thing. Like the, the, it's just too much. That was the messaging I was getting was this is too much. So I, I kept this in from ages 10 to 17 through middle school, high school. And it was right after the age change. Cause I still hadn't said anything that I was like, okay, I've got like this one thing that if this could be like cleared up, then, then I can go on a mission. Cause that's what I was very concerned about was like worthiness for a mission. Cause I had already gone to the temple in my mind, unworthy and felt horrible about it. I did not like going to the temple cause I felt like I was lying um, and, and kind of cheating the whole system. Um, and so to answer the question of what was this kind of big experience, I finally opened up to my mom about it. I told her everything I just told uh, everyone here and everyone watching, I guess. Um, and what I thought for sure was going to be just like, how could you? You are so gross. You're the worst. Do to do. I was met with um, just the kindest response from my mom. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and uh, I was blown away because I was I had convinced myself for seven years, like for most of my life, uh, for like almost half my life, that I could just like was a conscious being uh, that this was going to be a horrible experience telling my parents, and it was the complete opposite. So then my dad came home from work. Uh, I told him. And from, again, just where we were at, it was like, okay, the next steps is to tell the bishop. Um, and so my dad came with me. Um, it was the following Sunday. And uh, I told my bishop. Um, and from everything that I remember from that initial meeting, it was uh, one of the best days of my life because that burden and that weight and that big secret was no longer any of those things. And from what I uh, wanted to believe that Jesus could cover even pornography, I <coughs> I didn't think that was possible. And in that moment, I felt like it was possible. And so for me, I felt like that was a very personal experience with the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's what I was participating in was confessing sins to the proper people, um, which included the bishop. Um, and for the first time in a very long time, I felt guilt-free. And so I wanted to go share to the world that you, could, you don't have to feel bad about anything. You can tell Jesus, and he can cleanse you of your sins. Um, and that's what really motivated me to go uh, and was what made me excited to go on a mission was I felt like I had a really a powerful experience from what I, at that time, considered a pornography addiction. So I was like, this can rid you of addiction. This message of, you know, Jesus Christ and the gospel. Um, and so, yeah, there was a, it was my senior year. Finally felt um, what I considered the full effects of Jesus' sacrifice. And I was so excited to go and tell people that. And I, again, I was happy to be uh, speaking English because I was like, I want to be able to tell this in my own words and just everything I, I kind of understand. Um, yeah, so that was my kind of real big, like, this is my testimony. This is so real. It all felt so real to me because I kind of had this truncated, what I kind of saw as a truncated experience in the church. This is the true Jesus. All those lessons about, like, the Ted Bundy thing or whatever, this trumps all that for me in that moment was like, no, that was just this limited thing. This is really, yeah, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling good. Jesus saves all, covers all the sins. Here we go. Let's go on a mission. So I'm dying. I, I want to dig into and explore what happened to you overall, but mm -hmm. I don't want to get us out of the rhythm of the story. So I'm going to come back okay. at the end mm -hmm. to talk about the Ted Bundy, the, okay. I mean, in effect, I've never thought about this, Samantha, we always talk about, you know, the church has this object lesson about chewed gum or licked cupcake where they'll, you know, did you ever see that metaphor? I heard did about the object lesson. I heard about young women receiving those. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Where the young, you know, they'll pass around a cupcake that's licked and say, if you break the law of chastity, you're like a licked 
cupcake or chew a piece of gum and pass it around. And it's like, that's what happens if you have sex, yeah. you become a chewed piece of gum. I've thought about that in terms of like sexual purity, but I never thought that a, a Mormon kid could apply that to themselves in the pornography context. So that's, you just kind of yeah. drew some connections for me that I, because porn didn't exist when I was growing up, really. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit too old. So is that was that obvious, the, the porn chewed gum connection? Was that obvious for well, you? Well, yeah, I was thinking as he was talking, like it, it seems like the licked cupcake chewed gum thing is maybe more specific to young women. But I, I guess I hadn't really thought before right. about how regularly young men get talked to about pornography. They don't really talk to you about pornography that much as a young woman. Oh, the church, right. as, at least not in my experience. No. Yeah, so that was like, a, that was a new new insight for you too. Okay. Yeah. Also, yeah. The, kind of a side note, but me and Tanner have been reading a Jack Wayland book on our Patreon called Adam, which is you know the movie Charlie. There's a follow up book about her son, and that book, reading that, has just been so wild. Seeing how the church like creates pornography as a problem. Because like it sounds like because it's normal for ten year olds to be curious and that but then it's just it's intense hearing how there's immediately that shame cycle that begins and the church is like creating the problem selling the solution. It, it does just seem like pornography with young men is like a big tool for control yeah. because it the church kind of does set young men up to have pornography problems a lot of the time and maybe it's not actually an addiction even though you know who's yeah. to say. But it, it definitely, that shame cycle s feels like it's quite ubiquitous for a lot totally. of women. Yeah, women. and that's the discussion I want to come back to at the end. So, so it's queued up and ready for that. Let me just ask you, though, as you look back on your pre-mission adolescence and all that guilt and shame you fought, thought or felt, I'm, I'm sometimes I just feel like that's an unquestioning, unquestionable bad that youth ever feel guilt and shame. But then I also sometimes wonder whether having some sort of standard or some sort of like I need to do better maybe just helps you feel like you you want to be a better person. So I'm just wondering, as you look back on all that guilt and shame pre-mission, do you think of that as being like fundamentally damaging to you? Or as like, actually, it, because it resolved well, it kind of kept me on the straight and narrow. I'm wondering how you conceive of that guilt and shame now. Um, cause you carried a lot as a kid, right? Yeah. Um, I would say it was more <coughs> fundamentally damaging. Okay. Um, it's still, honestly, it still plays, uh, a role in my, in my just ways of thinking. And I'm, uh, in therapy right now to help resolve a lot of that. And I've been in therapy for, uh, for a bit trying to resolve that. So, um, I get what you're saying about, you know, having standards and, you know, kind of having, rules to guide yourself and if you break them to feel kind of like oh man i need to do better or whatever um but it was it was way too much okay because i felt because it was oh i've done this one thing i'm going to hell it was like a to b it wasn't like all oh, right tomorrow i'll try better and i'll just forget about it. it i was like that's it like i've ruined everything yeah when you combine no empty chairs comprehensive family pressure of not one empty chair with the ubiquity of porn. And then you add to that the chewed gum and then the Ted Bundy. Which when you think about the like that's chewed intense. gum, licked what? cupcake chewed gum, it's getting you to associate sexuality with repulsion or like disgust. Like right. that's the line that's being drawn there. That's why they do those object lessons. And mass murder. And right? murder. In this, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you're associating basically sexuality with perversion and murder. Mm. Well, yeah, and and also, I mean, there was, and I feel like it's a little bit less now, but especially when I was um, uh, in young men's, there was very much an emphasis on if we don't list sins, but if we were, were going to, denying the Holy Ghost, very bad. Murder is number two, and then immorality is three, and pornography use in those lessons was taught in that context. So that's, I think maybe that's why there was a connection with the Ted, Bu let's show this Ted Bundy tape, this awful yeah, serial killer in point. second and third hour of church. Just watch out. He was Mormon technically. So maybe I, I don't know what the connection was. I don't, 
I don't know, but it messed me up. I really was actually, like... Actually, Ted Bundy was baptized Mormon. Yes. Yeah. And, but wasn't there a Christian guy? So I can't remember the exact position, but they say that Ted Bundy was saying that as kind of a last-ditch attempt to appeal to the Christian Probably. guy who was... Probably. Yeah. 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 They're, yeah they're, I've I read that, too, to try to make sense of everything. Uh -huh. um, but... But yeah, there was a there was I would leave Sundays being like, okay, I can't look at it again, or I'll just be back on the Ted Bundy trail. <laughs> like that's where it'll lead, and because all I knew was porn is bad, and it equals this and this and this. One of those things could be Ted Bundy, mm, man. and so and just being and you know and maybe Ted Bundy isn't well known everywhere, but being in Utah, I I understood who Ted Bundy was and how horrific his stuff was. It's all pretty local. Uh, a lot of his uh, uh, crimes. And so, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry that happened. Yeah, that's hard stuff. And I, I, I do think that, um, you know, my, my local leaders were just trying to be like, hey, this stuff isn't great. Yeah. It just was a horrible execution <laughs> of that idea. <laughs> right. um, and, and again, too, I was... The I, the fact that as a kid I was confused that the this all encompassing atonement that could wash in something that was crimson into to pure white purity had an asterisk on it. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a missionary, and then when I came home and you know just had other teaching roles, that was my main emphasis in every lesson was like this message of Jesus is like for everything. Like, because I wasn't necessarily taught that um, so clearly, that was my, like, first thing was just, like, this Jesus guy, all of it. <laughs> and I, because I didn't want anyone, because my, my main thing was, like, I don't want anyone to feel like this, especially children, but anyone, I don't want anyone to think, like, I'm too far gone or whatever, because I felt that way for so long, so. Mm, yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. I mean, that's not, that's not super easy to share both because it was hard for you, but also because it's very personal. So thank you. Mm. Anything else you want to share about just your mission before we switch, switch over uh, to Madison? Was it a good mission? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I think it could be. Um, yeah. We don't have to spend a lot of time on, on it. I loved it. Uh, it was great. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you, did you have any like super faith affirming experiences or like, super faith challenging experiences on your mission? Uh, nothing faith challenging, um, but some pretty strong faith affirming. And those are, the, those were some experiences that I held on to until, um, for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and most of them were through giving priesthood blessings, just having an opportunity to, um, be like, all right, I'm just opening up my mind to kind of see what comes in here and just say those words. Um, giving blessings w one particular experience um a, a woman asked for a blessing to um heal a a fake tooth that she had uh for a, a long time and she had recently gone to the dentist and they're like all right we need to take out this tooth replace it it's gonna cost a lot of money she called us over and asked can you give me a blessing that it'll just heal so i won't have to pay this money and i was so scared because i'm like 19 20 years old, 18, and I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, she's asking me to, like, wipe away science, basically. Like, this dent <laughs> this dentist is saying it needs to be taken out. She's asking me to reverse that. So in my head, I said, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to be liable. And so while giving this blessing, <clears throat> I f in my head, I felt um, what I considered promptings of, like, tell her it'll heal. And I like deflected that like two or three times because again I was like I'm not touching this it was a very generic blessing up to that point like God loves you and you are awesome <laughs> and I was just like fighting this off until I finally said like I bless that your teeth will be healed and you won't have to get it replaced you went there I did because I just felt like it was so strong I just said it and she stood up she was crying like, this is a miracle this is a we leave I'm like dying inside I'm like oh my goodness um she calls us like a week later, it had healed and it, everything was fine. Everything had followed what she wanted and what wow. I felt like was God playing some sort of role in all this. And so I was like, oh, well, that was crazy. 
I mean, that was like, that was Church is true. Oh, absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, it followed like, right. If the priest did what I just did was truly in the, in the name of the priest so that Joseph Smith restored boom, boom, boom. It all dominoes down to the, the church is true. So that just reaffirmed it all. And by quite a bit too. Cause I was like, that was not me. I didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. I was the opposite. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was, that's one. And there were a couple, but that was like the strongest one on my mission where I was like, all right, there. I already knew it was true, but that just sealed the deal. Sealed, yeah. Okay. Do you love the Canadian people? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I will, and I just want to give a quick shout out too. We did dip a little bit into Minnesota <coughs> in our mission, so oh. I did cross the border, serve there too. So Lake Wobegon, basically. Uh, base it was called International Falls. It's like the fourth coldest place in the United States. Mm. It's very, it's called the ice box of the nation. That's their self-given nickname. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just want to give a quick shout out to the Minnesotans as well. And do Great you watch people. Letter Kinney? Did you ever watch? No? Okay. That's a, I guess that's a, some type of comedy show that features Canadians, but huh. no. Okay. Well, right. now we will. All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, how, should we switch to Madison? Let's do, yeah. I see. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Yeah. Madison, you've been super patient. Yeah. For 56 minutes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, That's uh, okay. Madison, where does your, uh, tell us where your Mormon story begins. Um, okay. I was basically born into a faith crisis. Um, my entire Whoa. life has been a faith crisis. Um, so my parents met in high school and they got pregnant with me in high school, their senior year. And my mom is the second youngest of eight children. Now, is this in Utah? Yes. In Woods Ooh, Cross, Utah Bountiful, pre- Utah. Oh, well, yeah. wait. A Mormon teen pregnancy in yes. Bountiful, Utah. Yes. What year? Around? Um, it was 1997. Okay. So, mm. yeah. A lot of... It was scandalous. And... So, yeah, my like, mom. Were your parents middle class, upper middle class? Um, like, it, like, were they of status or were they kind of like. Definitely a, not. Okay, my kinda. dad grew up super poor. Okay. Um, my mom's family was a little bit more well off than my dad's family, but it wasn't like they didn't have money by any means. Um, But, yeah, so they got pregnant with me in high school. Senior year? Yep. Okay. Um, Do you know what high school it was? Woods Cross. Okay. Yeah. Um, but my mom is the youngest of eight or the second youngest of eight siblings or seven siblings. I don't know. She has a lot of siblings and I am the only grandchild born out of one wedlock. Like it was a big deal. My grandparents were very Mormon. Um, and both, okay, both sides. Both sides. Okay. And my, both of my parents have really big families. My dad's the oldest and, so it was it was a very big deal that my mom was pregnant. Um, had a shotgun wedding before I was born. I was born January of 98. Which meant your dad didn't get to serve a mission. Nope. Dad didn't serve a mission. Um, that was a big no-no, especially because he was the oldest. And so he's the one who's supposed to be setting the example, all this stuff. So This is major shame parade stuff, yeah. right? And me being the product of that, my parents were being, you know, shamed and all this other stuff, me being the product of that, I couldn't separate the fact that I didn't make this mistake. I'm just the product of this mistake. I don't want to call it a mistake because it's you, it's me. (laughs) And also I don't think that it was a mistake, but I couldn't separate what people were saying about my parents as like, oh, they shouldn't have gotten pregnant. They should have waited until they were married. They should have gotten married in the temple. Your dad should have gone on a mission. I couldn't separate that from not being my fault. And so would you hear them say that? Mm-hmm. So like would they say it to you? Yeah. Adults? Um, yeah, like my grandparents. Um, and it was just a lot of like, you are the product of a bad decision, therefore you're bad. And it was always centered around church because it was like your parents should have gotten married in the temple. Your parents should have gone on missions. They shouldn't have gotten pregnant in high school. All this stuff. So I just like started out with like not a good Mormon family, if that makes any sense. But 
Um, so we didn't go to church a lot for the first, maybe like until I was like five. Um, but we did all the like stereo, like I got my baby blessing. Um, we just like, weren't going to church. We weren't like that perfect Mormon family in Utah. Can I just say like that shame parade, we, how many Mormon stories have we done where it's like, okay, where'd you go on your mission? Okay. What was your temple marriage? Like, okay. What was it like going through the temple? Mm -hmm. And then you just add to it that everybody knows that, that your parents had sex in, in yeah. both of their wards and the grandparents and the siblings and everybody. It would make sense that they would basically check out of the church for five years yeah. because they couldn't do any of those things. Mm-hmm. And literally everyone who mattered knew. Yeah. And it's the sin next to murder. So like it, it sounds so, it probably sounds so trivial to just know a person. Oh, High school pregnancy, baby out of wedlock. Yeah. But this is like Mormon catastrophe, mm-hmm. of shame catastrophe. Like uh, your story was horrific, uh, Tommy. And this is like 50 times worse. Am I wrong or am I right? I think they're, am I over-exaggerating? I think they're different kinds of bad. I think that it <laughs> definitely, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just trying to paint a picture for yeah. what it must have been like yeah. for your yeah. parents and why they would just stop going to church for five years in Utah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, not only did they get pregnant in high school, but they weren't allowed to go get sealed in the temple because after you, I don't know if this was a rule, but if you don't get married in the temple, which they didn't, they had just had a civil ceremony. Then you had to wait a year. I think that rule has changed since in like the past three or four years. Mm, I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, so they weren't allowed to attend the temple. Um, and so we ended up getting sealed after my sister was born. Um, but yeah, my parents ended up getting married and I have two other siblings. But the start of my life was just like, you're not a good Mormon. You are the product of sin, essentially. <laughs> and yeah, so that is kind of how I started off. Um, and then I grew up in Utah, which that just adds another layer and everyone could tell that like my parents were super young, even for Utah, like Utah has young parents, but my parents were 18 and 19 when they had me. And so I would be in like elementary school and they'd be like, why do your parents look so young? And I would be like, cause they had me in high school. So it just, it was oh. like this thing that followed me around everywhere. And you would tell people you wouldn't yeah, try to hide it. I wouldn't try to hide it. I don't think I ever tried to hide it just because I didn't like, I knew that it wasn't okay, but I, like my parents never told me like, oh, th- this is a bad thing that we did. It was always other people. And so they weren't ashamed of it. And so I wasn't ashamed to tell other people, even though I knew I was the product of sin. Um, But yeah, so I grew up in Utah, like super, super sheltered Utah. Once we started going back to church, um, it was like a, a 180. Like we were put on that face of a perfect Mormon family. And if we did something wrong, that was the end of the world kind of thing. Um, and I just remember like we were so Mormon to the point where there was a new girl that moved into our neighborhood and I was hanging out with her. We were becoming friends and I'm like in third grade and I found out that she wasn't Mormon and I run home. I was playing at her house. I run home with tears in my eyes. I'm, I asked my mom, like, I can't be friends with her anymore. Can I? Because she's not Mormon. And my mom hesitated (laughs) and she was like, I don't know. Like I'll have to meet her parents, but like any other Mormon kids, I didn't, my parents didn't care. Um, so yeah, we, like my circle was very limited. I only talked to Mormons. I don't think I saw a person of color living in Syracuse, Utah. Like, It was very, very sheltered. Um, And then we moved to Virginia when I was 11. And that was like my entire worldview just like exploded. Um, The first day that we moved there, I, um, Haymarket, Gainesville area. Okay. Yeah. Um, The first day that we were there, I was playing with a girl that lived next door to us. And I asked her if she was Mormon. And she said yes. I was like, oh, great. We can be friends because you're Mormon. And later on, I was like, hey, I haven't seen you at church. 
but you told me that you were Mormon. And she was like, yeah, that's my mom's maiden name. So she thought she didn't know what Mormon was. And so I was just like, there were probably five or six LDS kids in my school. And, um, that's kind of when I kind of the same situation of Tommy is in like Mormonism isn't the only worldview that you can have or like we were definitely in the minority which changed a lot of things for my life um I started becoming really rebellious (laughs) and I did not want to go to church I hated church um and then we only lived in Virginia for two years and then we moved to Idaho which back in the Mormon belt whatever they call it um even maybe more so than Utah because I lived in Eagle, Idaho, and it's just like everyone and their dog is Mormon. Um, And that's kind of when things in my family started to like crumble. So since I, we started going back to church when I was five or six, um, we were putting on this face of like being a perfect Mormon family. We were doing all the things that we were supposed to be doing, doing family scripture study, all this other stuff. And then When we moved to Idaho, there were some things going on with my parents' marriage and um, that were not, like, kosher with the church. And I won't get into it because I don't know how much they would appreciate me sharing. But um, that's kind of when I started realizing, like, oh, yeah, my family isn't good Mormon family. Like we have all these things going on under the surface, like, um, a lot of tension. And I was also viewing pornography, um, which you don't get those lessons in young women's, you get the, this is a boy's problem, not a girl's problem. Um, and so I didn't think anything was wrong with it until we had a lesson about it. And I, was like devastated. I thought that I was a terrible person, all this pretty, a lot of the same feelings that Tommy had. Um, but yeah, that's kind of when I realized like, oh, my family is not perfect. Like we've never been perfect. There was a lot of shame around just my being born and then pornography and then things that were going on with my parents. Like, um, like there were threats of divorce and that's like not, okay for Mormons. Um, you try to stick together as much as you can. Um, and then can I say that what I know about teen pregnancies, Mm -hmm. definitely in Mormonism, Mm -hmm. and I'm guessing this isn't a uniquely Mormon problem. Is it just because two kids have sex in high school? Does not mean they should be married and have lots of kids? A hundred percent. And so, but, but, but if in a conservative culture, Mm -hmm. that's what you do. Yeah. Then it puts two people together, super young, before they know them themselves yeah. and each other, and then they've already got a kid, they haven't got a, 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 an education yet. Yeah, it's. I mean, Samantha, you're sh- you're shaking your head. Are you agreeing? It's just. Yeah, well, I just. I mean, you. It's hard to individuate within what in Mormonism is supposed to be like a codependent dynamic like that. That you ha- like you immediately have to fit your relationship into this. You you immediately have to step into these roles that you're not grown up enough to. You know, it's just hard. It's hard to, like, find healthy adult autonomy within a marriage. Like, it's easier to do it before. Yeah. Yeah. And what I'm slightly surprised about, based on what I know about Mormon culture, when there's an unwed teen pregnancy, is it okay to call it that? Like, is, is my understanding is historically in the Mormon church, they pressure the young woman to give the child up to adoption. Mm -hmm. So that LDS Family Services, the Mormon Adoption Agency, can place that baby with, quote, a good family, uh, mm-hmm. a, a worthy family, and give the woman a, a young chance to kind of have her adolescence and early adulthood. But it, so do you know if your parents were? Um, were my mom was never pressured to put me up for adoption. However, she was pressured to get an abortion. What? And I found that out like in my teen years and that wrecked me. My mom never thought about it once. She was like, absolutely not. But I guess she was pressured by a bishop and a few family members to get an abortion, Whoa. which is very surprising. 
I've but, never heard of a Mormon bishop yeah. encouraging a woman to get an abortion. Yeah, in '97, because I've heard that like the American Christian right didn't used to be as anti-abortion. Like it's been like a political tool that has evolved. But mm-hmm. '90s feels like it no, would have been. Like, yeah, I, that, there. that's that's almost unheard of in my experience. Yeah. but who knows what happens behind the scenes? I think what happened is said family member was really good friends with the bishop, and the family member wanted my mom to get an abortion, and so they talked to him and were like, "Hey, we want." this is what we want. And we know that like, it's not something that you would normally do, but this is the first time this has ever happened in our family. And I am not the oldest grandchild. Like there are tons of grandkids before me, but they're all, their parents are both married and they were all born the right way. And so I think it was just like, we can't deal with this. And they didn't want to send my mom away to like, I've heard of people like being sent to Washington totally. to give birth and like, then you come back and you're not, but my and, mom was and, still and in no, high school. No one's told. So like, yeah, they would send a Mormon girl who's pregnant away to like mm-hmm. the grandma's in Ohio. Yeah. Not tell anyone. She just like did a study abroad yeah. as, as far as everyone knows. And then comes back without a kid and the kid got adopted, but yeah. that's not what, no, that was not the case. Um, my mom's just never talked about if she was pressured to give me up for adoption, but Um, and my mom also didn't tell me that she was pressured to get an abortion. I read her journal. Mm. So (laughs) that's on me. Sorry, mom. (laughs) I'm, I think she knows this by now. So if she listens to this, it won't be a surprise, but, um, yeah, abortion was talked about and yeah, that caused a lot of my parents don't want me, even though I grew up in a very loving home and my parents have never said that I just couldn't separate the two between Oh, this person in my mom's family said that I that she should get an abortion. That must mean that they don't like me and yada yada yada. So And the whole reason I got us down this track was just to say that that's a really hard way to start yeah. a marriage and a family. So it doesn't surprise me that your parents Yeah. were struggling by the time you're what age? Um, I think I was fourteen the first time they talked about divorce, which looking back is surprising that they lasted so long. Um, they ended up having two more kids, my brother and my sister. And yeah, I, and I mean, they were married for 20 to 23 years. Yeah. Miraculous achievement, really. And, but yeah, their marriage just was not set up for success. They probably honestly did not want to get married in the first place. They were boyfriend and girlfriend in high school. And like, I don't want to speak for them, but I just... Yeah, they did not have the tools to succeed in their marriage. And so we, they ended up not getting divorced, but we ended up moving to the Netherlands for my dad's job, um, my junior and senior year of high school. And that, I really dug down into the church I was doing early morning seminary. There were surprisingly a lot of LDS people there at my school of 98 graduate my 98 person graduating class there were like five or six kids that were LDS so we all did early morning seminary together and I was just like this is the true church I am happy here even though like if I would have looked deep into myself and like took some time to actually think about it I don't think I would have had that same reaction um but I was able to um, become friends with a lot of people who experience different cultures, were a part of different l- religions, and that really opened up my worldview because this whole time I was living in Utah and Idaho, and it just like your worldview is just so small. Um, and I think later down the road that really changed things for me because I was able to see like, oh, these people are happy even though they're not a part of the Mormon church, even though this whole time I've been told the Mormon church is the true and only way to true happiness. Um, But yeah, then I ended up moving. I I mention this frequently, but Mark Twain has this quote that travel is fatal to Mm -hmm. prejudice. Yeah. And that is one of the most common, let's just say top 10 things Mm -hmm. that cause people to lose their faith in Mormonism. It's meeting happy non-Mormons. Which yeah. sounds weird. Yeah. But it can be a it can be a shelf breaker. Yeah. It <laughs> totally can be. And I think that I think you can either go one of two ways. Either you double down like I did, or you go the complete opposite way and you're like, oh well, these people can be happy. I, that means that I can probably be happy outside of the church as well. 
Um, but yeah, I really dug down, graduated seminary, early morning seminary at six o'clock in the morning and riding my bike to seminary at a member's house in the dark. Um, and yeah, we were going to church the whole time. My dad was the ward mission leader. So we had missionaries in and out of our house all the time. Um, and yeah, we were, my parents were still having marital issues, but they were not acting like it. Um, especially at church. And I think another thing that really showed me that Mormonism is not the only place that you can be happy is that my parents were not happy and they were very Mormon. Um, And yeah, so living in the Netherlands, ended up moving back to Utah for college and my parents ended up getting divorced. And that crushed me. Even though like I knew that my parents did not necessarily have a happy marriage it still was like, there was again, that shame of like perfect Mormon family. And now your parents are getting divorced and they were wanting to cancel their temple ceiling as well. And that's kind of when my shelf started to break a little bit. Tell, tell people, cause that happened to me. Mm-hmm. Tell people what that's like when you believe you're in an eternal family, mm-hmm. kind of the no empty chairs thing. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, not only are your parents getting divorced, but they want to get their ceiling canceled. Mm-hmm. What, what goes through a, a Mormon kid's mind when all that happens? Um, I was terrified. And well, tell people why, though. So I just, when, yeah, so when you get married, you make these covenants that you're going to be together forever. And even, like, not just forever, for eternity, like, forever and ever. And... If you break those, then you're no longer eligible to be in the highest degree of heaven. Um, And yeah, it was just terrifying because you hear all these stories of like people like leaving the church after they get divorced. And that's kind of the track that my mom was on. And yeah, I was, I was terrified because I wasn't going to be able to be with my family in heaven. It's kind of the opposite of no empty chairs. It's all empty chairs. All empty chairs. It means that your parents and all their kids are not going to be together yeah. in heaven. Now that's a weird thing because let's just say you're all in the terrestrial kingdom. Mm-hmm. You're all then in the we're terrestrial all kingdom. You should be all yeah. together, right? But somehow in Mormonism, yeah. you're you're God's gonna like, okay, you're in the same kingdom. But you can't but live in the same you, house. We're like you're, you're yeah. But it was all empty chairs because yeah. you all had failed. Yeah. That's a weird flip of what you were experiencing, Tommy. Yeah. And it wasn't anything I did. Yeah. And right. so I was exactly. getting punished for you can't go to the social kingdom. No. Unless you marry again. Unless I was gonna get married, yes. Right. Yeah. Which I was still planning on getting married, but okay. I was But you wouldn't be with I was family. eighteen. Yeah. I was going to call like I wasn't gonna be with my mom and dad. Right. Or my brother and sister. Because I was going to be with wrong. my husband. Yeah, you whoever did that nothing was going to be. Yeah. But now you weren't gonna be able to be with your mom mm-hmm. and dad and your siblings. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Hard. And there yeah. And there was also a th- threat of my dad getting excommunicated because there was some infidelity in their marriage. And so there was that. And then my parents canceling their temple ceiling, me not being able to go to the highest degree of heaven. And just like all these things piled on at once. And I was going to college the next week. So I was just like a wreck and my, yeah, my entire family, my family was broken is what I felt like. And, um, I wasn't able to be there for my siblings who were having a really hard time with it because I had to go to college. Like that was just something in my family. Like you go to college, there's no, you can't not go to college. (laughs) Um, and so I ended up going to Utah state. Um, and yes, go Aggies. I love them. But I, Yeah, I was in a YSA ward and it was just not a good time because I was hearing all of these stories about eternal families and getting married in the temple. And at this time, I was not worthy to go in the temple because of pornography issues. Um, And so I couldn't go to the temple on my own. I, my family wasn't going to be together in heaven. Like all these things were just piling up on me. Um, And I, yeah, I just wasn't having a good time. It was a bad time. (laughs) Did you ever talk to a bishop about pornography? I did. So. And and 
You don't have to share this. Oh, no, I totally you want to share. Yeah, I totally will. Um, I am just wanting to be careful because it might be a little bit triggering. Um, but my pornography view viewing came as a result of sexual assault. Um, like when I was very, very young, I was forced to watch pornography and it became what I thought was an addiction with my limited knowledge of what addiction was. Um, from the time I was six until I was 18 and I told nobody about it until I went and talked to my YSA Bishop. And luckily he was fantastic. Um, I had one of my roommates come with me because I was terrified and I just like, yeah, so there were all of these things that were just one on top of the other. Like, you know, when it rains, it pours kind of thing. You were feeling super guilty that you're looking at pornography. Yes. So you wanted to repent. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And then I was feeling guilty about my parents getting divorced, even though I knew that it wasn't my fault. I was Ooh. getting penalized for my parents not being married. And I would just wonder also, and I don't want to project this on no, you. No, but if you were born out of wedlock and then the marriage was hard because it got mm -hmm. off to a hard start, even though you didn't choose to be born out of wedlock, yeah, I would wonder whether as a kid you still might feel somehow oh, yeah. re responsible. I felt a ton of guilt for it. And not only because of things that other family members were saying, but because my mom had guilt about it. And she never projected that onto me on purpose but, you know, kids pick things up, and so I felt guilty. And so, yeah, just my entire childhood, and even up until probably I was, like, 20, I just was ridden with guilt for multiple things. My parents breaking the law of chastity and me being born, my pornography viewage, and then my parents getting divorced. Like, there were just – and I thought that my parents' divorce was my fault because they got married because of me, so therefore – they got divorced because of me, which therapy is great. Everyone <laughs> go to therapy, working through that. But yeah, so that is just, I felt so guilty. And then, so yeah, I did go and talk to a bishop about all of these things. And that was a really good experience for me. Luckily, I know that a lot of people have really bad experiences with their bishops. Um, but that was the first time I had ever talked to a bishop. And luckily it was a good experience. Um, well, let's celebrate it. So what, yeah. how, how did the bishop, for all the Mormon bishops that watch Mormon stories yeah. <laughs> and all the future Mormon bishops, here's how to handle this situation yeah. well. What did he do? Um, He basically just said that it was okay and that I, that it wasn't my fault and that, which I didn't believe him at first because even though at the start of me viewing pornography was not my fault because I was forced into it. Um, the rest of the times I thought that that was my fault because I continued to go back and, but he made it very clear. Like, it's not your fault. You don't need to be ashamed of it. Here are some tools and resources to help you stop. If that's what you want to do. He was encouraging me to stop, which was something I wanted to do. I didn't want to view pornography anymore. Um, and, yeah, he was just, he was very, very kind about it. He did not try to shame me about it. He did not go on this rampage about how pornography is bad or, you know, it, like the lessons that Tommy got in um, young men's. Like, it was not like that at all. I had a very good experience, which if it was a bad experience, I don't know what would have happened. Like, I probably would have left the church when I was 18. Um, but... Yeah, it ended up being a really great experience, and I left it feeling very good and kind of re-energized in my membership of the church. Um, so I kept going to church for, I mean, every week. I was in a YSA ward. I was in leadership positions and Relief Society, all that. Um, all of my friends went to church, all my roommates. I somehow ended up in a room of eight girls my freshman year. All of them were LDS which we were the only one, like the only room that all of us were LDS. So we were like the golden room to our bishop, which so we just had, we had planned a lot of activities. We were all in leadership positions. Um, I was constantly surrounded by Mormonism. Um, and then I, my dad got married, remarried, um, and they were getting sealed in the temple, and I wanted to go. So I decided to do my endowment. 
Um, I didn't go on a mission. So there really, I wasn't about to get married. So there really wasn't any reason I should, you know, not, not that I shouldn't have gotten in my endowment, but there wasn't like a, I need to get my endowment for this. So I'm, you know, like a mission or getting married. Um, and that is when things took a little bit of a turn. (laughs) So I went through the temple and I left feeling horrible. Okay. Really quickly. You haven't met Tommy yet. No, no, no. I have not met Tommy. So you're a student at Utah Mm -hmm. State University, not going on a mission, which means for most young men and women, they wouldn't be going through the temple because most Mormons, when they go through the temple for the first time, do it either to go on a mission or to get married. Mm -hmm. So it's kind Mm -hmm. of a sign of you trying to be extra righteous that you would, you would want to do that. Mm Mm-hmm absent admission and marriage. Yeah. So, so you choose to go mm-hmm. to the temple. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't, I hadn't met Tommy. I hadn't met anyone that I was like potentially going to get married to. Like there was no reason for me to go through the temple except for that. I wanted to go and witness my dad's ceiling. Um, and so, yeah, I went through, my mom couldn't go through the temple with me, which was honestly really heartbreaking for me at the time. Um, so I ended up having a friend go with me because I just, yeah, I didn't have anybody else to go with me. Um, cause my siblings are younger and my mom couldn't go. And I, yeah, I went through the temple, had a panic attack. It what? was huh? What? just, what? was it because of the content? Yeah. Or? I just, I was so confused. I was uncomfortable. I, are you comfortable sharing what made you uncomfortable? Yeah, or confused um, you? I think So I went through the temple like two or three weeks before they changed that women have to veil their face during the prayer. That made me super uncomfortable because the men didn't have to do it. That bothered you? Yeah. And at this point, I I was not a feminist growing up, but at this point I was kind of learning more about it and becoming more, just becoming more of a feminist. And so that made me extremely uncomfortable. And... I think that was the first time that I felt like it was a little bit cultish. And there were just things that I, like just the secretive nature of it. And yeah, I just, it was just so uncomfortable, The everything about it. Like I, I could just list everything that happened in the temple I was uncomfortable with. There wasn't one specific thing. It was just everything. The movie, yeah. the, the signs, the tokens, mm-hmm. all that. Yeah. Okay. And washings and anointings. Yeah. Um, it just yeah. everything. And was your was your was it sewn up on the side? Yeah. Or? Okay. So it was sewn up. To, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nobody touched me, which I was and the I think what made me the most mm. angry about it was that I had asked people, hey, what's going to go on in the temple? Because I was scared. Um, I worked at a place where everyone had been endowed. They'd all gone on missions. Um, So I was asking my coworkers, like, what can I expect? And they were all making jokes, making me even more scared. Like, you know, you just read stories. My boss told me that you had to sacrifice a goat, which like, I was like, you obviously don't have to do that. But why are you telling me that? Like, does something similar happen? Do you have to like act like you're sacrificing a goat? I don't know. So I was terrified. And I went into the temple. Obviously, none of those things happened that they were joking about and telling me. But I just was uncomfortable. And it did not bring me a feeling of peace like everyone said it would. And so I leave the temple and I'm like in tears and... I, I remember my dad saying, you just have to keep going to get used to it. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I don't want to keep going. I don't want to go to the temple ever again. And he was like, well, it, it's it's just a little bit weird. I know that blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, I don't want to go again. Like, I don't want to have to get used to it. I want it to be a good experience now. And it wasn't, it was a bad experience. And yeah, so I was extremely upset about that. Um, and then my parent, my 
dad and stepmom ended up not even getting sealed when they were supposed to get sealed. So I didn't even have to do my endowment then. And then you're stuck with wearing garments. Yes. <laughs> and garments are so uncomfortable. Let me just say that. That's a whole nother issue. But yeah, I just, it just wasn't a good experience for me. And I, I went into it hoping that it was like, I thought that it was going to be a life changing experience. I was going to feel so much peace and so much happiness and closer to my savior. And I just didn't. And it was such a letdown. And like, and I didn't just leave having a bad experience. I left terrified, like crying, bawling, hyperventilating. Like it was not a good experience at all. Mm. I don't know how to like describe it besides not a good experience. And but you hadn't like found old temple ceremonies on YouTube. I had. Oh, you had. When I was probably like eight or nine and it scared me. Okay. And so I turned it off. Okay. Um, Because, you know, you're told don't look up anti-Mormon literature. Don't look up whatever. Don't Google anything is essentially what I was told growing up. And so, yeah, I, ha I had looked it up and it, it was scary to me. So I didn't look. And you also, I just felt silly too in the outfits that you're supposed to wear. I felt I was embarrassed. And when you go to your endowment for the first time, they ask you before you do the, um, before you make promises and covenants, if you would like to leave. And I had looked at my dad and I was like, I kind of want, like, I'm not comfortable. I want to leave. And he was like, it's fine. Just stick, stick with it. And I felt pressured because my grandma who had Alzheimer's had come to my endowment and it was like a big ordeal for her to come. And I had tons of family there, tons of friends. And so I was like, if I leave, all these people are going to be like, what are you doing? Like, we're here for you. Why are you not, you know? And so I felt pressured to stay. And I think if I was there with just my parents, I would have <clears> left because I just, because you get the anointing done before you go into the I don't even remember what room it is, there's but that part of, there's, a, there's that part where they say, if any of you yeah. want to leave now of your own free will and choice, you mm -hmm. can do so before you know what, what's yeah, about before to happen, you know right? what's about to happen. And I thought that I was making, well, I was making promises with God yeah. and that was a really special thing to me. And it just ended up not being special and it was really disappointing mm -hmm. and scary. So, I'm so sorry. yeah, that's kind of when things started to go downhill for me. Um, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to share about your story before meeting Tommy? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, what, you, what grade are you at USU when you kind of have this temple experience? Um, I was a sophomore, so I had actually transferred to UVU. So I had, I met Tommy mm, October, November, just five months after I got endowed. Okay. So it wasn't too long. After. Okay. Yeah. So what made you decide to go to the wrong university from from Utah State. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, All those Wolverines out there. I I'm actually, totally um, I went through a really, really, really bad breakup um, that he broke up with me because God told him to. Ooh. Even though he was talking about getting married and like all this other stuff, he was talking to my roommate about buying an engagement ring and all this other stuff. And he ended up going home for Thanksgiving and ghosted me. And when he came back, I was like, what? Like, and he was like, God told me I have to break up with you. I was like, okay. So I ended up leaving Utah State because I was just like devastated. And I also was failing out of my classes because my parents were going through a divorce. And yeah, so it was just a mess. I ended up dropping out of college completely. So yeah, but. Do you believe that God told him not to no. marry you? No, I think that he... I really Why hope you he doesn't Samantha? listen to Why this, but no, I, I've got one of those breakups as yeah. well. <laughs> I think every well, morning which girl does. Which end were you on? I, I think both. Well, no, more the more <laughs> getting broken up with. Yeah, <laughs> but God? we've all we've all introduced it into a breakup. God <laughs> didn't feel like he was right for either of you. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. God told me that we were going to get married, <laughs> so I was like, somebody's not telling the truth, and it's not me. So I was really, I was mad about it. Not because like, then why can't God communicate exactly? More clearly? And I was like, why is God telling me one thing but you another thing? And he had he had said something about uh, that it's because he was a man and he had the priesthood, and so God would speak more clearly to him. Oh, yeah. and I was like. 
Cool. <laughs> that, awesome. that was helpful. Yeah. So yeah, we ended up breaking up and I was super upset about it. And so I moved back home with my parents and I ended up going to, well, with my mom and then moved to Utah, Valley. Utah Valley University. Yes. How so. long was that relationship? Um, probably five or six months, which is not a long time for me to be devastated, but, but you in are Mormonism. In infatuation yeah. Phase. Yeah. yeah. So brutal. Yeah. It wasn't very nice. Okay. But, but I'm over it now. It's all good. <laughs> and it sets you up to meet the man. Exactly. <laughs> the right, man. Tommy? Uh, yeah. Thank you <laughs> yeah. to that man. And thank you to God too. Yeah. yeah. God Shout told him. To God. God hooked you up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But why do you tell her to marry the other guy? Uh, you know, I'm those, kidding. We don't, Polygamy. Yeah, those details, we just forget about those. But, <laughs> yeah. You know. All right. Well, this was, I mean, anything else you want to tell about your story before we so. switch back to Tommy? Yeah. Well, I guess, well, how long after your mission did it take before you met? Uh, four years. A long four years. time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's switch back to Tommy. Mm -hmm. Had a great mission in Canada with the Canucks. Yes. Did you did you learn to say a like did you come home saying a in a boot? Uh, not? <laughs> not not a boot, but a yes. M uh, mostly, honestly, a little forced because I knew that I would have friends coming home with French accents and <laughs> Spanish. Oops, I forgot that English word type stuff. So I wanted something. So. <laughs> I did. I would I'm like. Oops! I said a like that slipped out. <laughs> oh, no. uh, it's embarrassing. But that was just what I understood about like kind of the. Well, you did that culture. consciously. Uh, yeah. Oh my god, um, that's awesome. Because I, I, I just I knew that that would happen with my other friends. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna. Do I want to be cool too. Yeah. So I just I just understood. I think I under like I thought I understood like the culture, and I just didn't, I wanted to play a role. So okay. it's silly. So anything interesting or important about your Mormon story from the end of your mission to meeting Madison? Uh, yeah, a lot. Um, so um, I can kind of breeze through 2015, so when I got home, uh, to 2018. Um, those years were filled with a lot of uh, faith-promoting activities. I was going to church, um, uh, believed it all. Uh, active, faithful, all the things. Um, and I do want to just add one quick anecdote. Um, as a part of all that, I just was looking for uh, content to consume. Um, so I remember uh, pretty qu uh, pretty quickly after my mission, because um, I, I am a big fan of podcasts, so I went to the podcast app, Apple Podcasts, typed in Mormon, saw Mormon stories, and I was like, perfect, stories about Mormons. Um, and the first one I came across, that was not why I named it. Mormon. No, and I know. I, and, and I, okay, I, maybe it was a little bit. Why I named it. And, um, it, it worked. Um, and the first episode I ever, uh, listened to, which I was excited at first and then mad, <laughs> like at a, an hour or two in was with Sam and Tanner, Ooh. um, which was later that year, I believe in 2015. So this is like. This is like short haired Tanner and married Sam. I don't, I'm sorry I brought that up. I don't yeah. know if that's a yeah. sensitive topic, but this is, this is like seven years ago now. So this was, this episode for the listeners of viewers, it's called Losing Mormon Millennials. And Samantha makes fun of me because every time we talk about it, I say, number one, it's a legendary episode because this was right, this was recorded right when the church was starting to hemorrhage its millennials. But also, it's the episode that Tyler Glenn from Neon Trees found. It caused him to actually heal from a lot of trauma that he had experienced. But right, it's go. a legendary episode. We're going to include it in the show notes. Are we? So yeah. did you think <laughs> for the first hour that it was going to be like faith promoting and how someone resolved the... Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was... Good job, John. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was going to be about how to stop the losing of mm. Mormon millennials. I was like, because I... So I, I uh, had known about Sam from her... Uh, millennial Mormon days um, as a missionary. Um, Samantha was a like a faithful Mormon blogger. Eight tips on dating from Jeffrey R. Holland. <laughs> <laughs> that was a smash hit, you know. And as a so as a missionary, about like halfway through, we got permission to use Facebook as a proselyting tool, uh, which is a questionable <laughs> decision. But um, I enjoyed it, you know, because you know back in those days. 
two times a year you get to talk to your family so any sort of outside anything was uh, I welcomed um, but I did see some millennial Mormon posts going through so I saw Sam so when I saw her on the episode I was like oh awesome like this is a fellow Mormon millennial <laughs> and here we go and so my first ever um, I, I just I just add that because from like that moment I was like turned off from Mormon stories I was like oh, they got me like this is some Bush League stuff. <laughs> really <laughs> quickly, was it that we misbehaved, or was it just that the story didn't end like you wanted? Were we too sarcastic? N- or- no, I, I, well, yeah. So I thought it just didn't end the way I thought it was going okay. to, and I was like, "That's not a Mormon story. That's an ex-Mormon story." Oh, okay. Was my process, and again, I'm three months off the mission. I'm not oh, entertain yeah. entertaining any sort of, uh, you know, that kind of content. So, um, so yeah. Bad first taste from Mormon stories. Sorry. It's, it's, uh, it, no, sorry. it's fine. No, you don't have to apologize. That's just is how, how it went down. Um, but, yeah, so um, that's just a little anecdote from 2015 and 2018. That's where I was, was uh, faith-promoting stuff. Um, uh, yeah. And then the next big uh, event um, in my personal Mormon story was um, October of 2018. Uh, I was on the bus with my with one of my sisters she's the one she's she's in the bigs not the littles so she her and i are 14 months apart uh she's younger um just so just so she knows i don't know why i said that so strongly (laughs) she's younger um but yeah so we're very close in age and we're um just a lot of life stuff we were close forever and we still are and probably forever will be um and she um told me that she had her first kiss and I was like oh this is awesome congratulations and then she said and it was with a girl and I was shocked and we're also like on a public bus she told me so I'm like standing up I'm like oh my goodness this is like one of the craziest moments of my life and here I am on the middle of the bus um and I I was just thrown by the idea um that uh, that she wasn't straight because that's that, that was just the default. I was like, and yeah, and and she made it clear that she, uh, you know, had feelings for this, for this girl. They'd gone out on a couple dates, and at that point, she came out to me as uh, bisexual, and it was National Coming Out Day, she, so she felt like it was apropos to tell me, um, and I was, um. We're going to an event, so we did that event. We came back, and then when it was just me, like, at my apartment, I was like, oh, wow. Because for me, this potentially shook up the whole no empty chairs thing. That was where my first thought went was, okay, how does this affect eternity? And (coughs) just through kind of what I'm sharing, you can maybe get an idea of just my thought processes are just, like, all right, A to, like, capital capital b like it was it's just such like huge things kind of catastrophizing stuff um but what i was faced with in that moment was i love my sister grace and the fact that she came out to me i like i took an internal like kind of review of my feelings and i was like i don't feel like sad like sad or any, anything negative because I asked myself like how does this affect like this affects no empty chairs pause and then I was like but I'm not like I'm happy for her. and that was like there was conflict in there from that result because I was like am I supposed to feel that she's like sinning am I, how am I how am I supposed to react could be because I don't know if this I'm, I'm reacting the right way um and so um for whatever reason, that kind of prompted a, let me just kind of do a check on what I actually believe in terms of God, in terms of Jesus, in terms of Mormonism. Let me just do kind of like an internal review of my beliefs. And so I imagined I was kind of pulling things off like a bookshelf of like, all right, this is what I believe in with God currently, and it's what I've always said. Do I actually believe this? And I went through with everything. And at that time, basically I came back and was like, yep, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. Except for um, LGBTQ 
uh, relationships as being bad or sinful or whatever negative or yeah i think sinful would be the most simple way that the church teaches them to be um because i was at this point um the church's language was feelings are fine acting on those feelings are bad and so i personally disagreed with that and that was like my first ever disagreement with um anything a church leader had taught uh, was that moment because I didn't when my sister told me I was like if I really personally thought this was bad or sinful then I would be feeling differently but I don't so what does this mean either I'm wrong or the church is wrong and that was the first time I ever decided that even maybe the church is incorrect I have to ask this is going to go back a little bit in time but in 2015 <clears throat> November 2015 the church would have announced its exclusion policy where it said that children of gay same-sex married couples couldn't really be mormon um and they declared same-sex marriage as an act of apostasy worse than rape and murder Mm -hmm. do you remember when the exclusion policy was issued in 2015 and how each of you felt about it and then do you remember in 2018 when it was rescinded and and god said never mind i take that back yes i'll go first yeah that one um, so when it came out, so yeah, so I came home in June of 2015. It, the policy comes out in November of 2015. I am still very faithful, like probably, you know, very, yeah, very, very faithful. And I, um, adopted every kind of apologist, um, opinion, which was, you know, we're looking like they're looking out for the, the kids well being. And I didn't have in context of the whole apostasy thing. Um, of like it being worse than the things that you just mentioned. Um, I was like, well, of course it's bad because marriage is between a man and a woman, so that seems to be, you know, fair or whatever. I, but, for, but for me, the biggest thing was the kids, you know, couldn't be baptized. My idea was, oh, I mean, that makes sense for the sake of the kids. If you had asked me, oh, why, or any dug any deeper, I wouldn't have had anything to say, but I just kind of adopted that. Um, opinion and then in the reversal of it um, that was actually a big thing to me where I was like so did they just was there like a a, like a wire that was misplaced in the communication so they thought that they heard like do it and then like (laughs) it took a while to it it was really it threw me off Um, and that was another thing of like they there was a revelation claim here and a revelation in 2015 and a revelation claim in 2018 how can revelations be the exact opposite and from that was a big thing for me actually was like this word is being used quite liberally if two competing ideas are both from the same god what the heck is going on yeah i kind of felt the same way um i was actually still in high school when the in in 2015 and i don't think i knew anybody that was gay more or less had children and were in a gay relationship. And so I kind of had the idea that it didn't affect me. And I remember feeling a little bit upset about it, but not because they were, you know, like making policies that negatively affected gay people, but because why couldn't these kids get baptized (coughs) and be a part of the true church and, be happy. That's kind of where my anger came from. Um, and then, yeah, I had the same feelings about the reversal. I was like, I was very confused and kind of like, why would you put these people through all this heartbreak and pain and just these people who are trying to do their best. And now you're bringing up all that pain and heartbreak again. It made me angry and confused. Yeah. Okay. All right. So back to 2018. Yeah. So, um, so your sister comes out to you and you decide you're going to love her. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. Then maybe it, it doesn't feel wrong to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. cause I saw in her reaction, like true, uh, like th- it was good news. It was happy. She was happy about it. And there was just something in her eyes that was like, I had my first kiss, and it was with this awesome 
girl that I met and we've gone on a couple of dates and we really mesh well. And I, you know, and, and just talking about sibling stuff, I had known that she had previously tried to go on dates with, um, with men and they, it didn't turn out super well. And so this was a, a, a happy, uh, scenario. And so, um, I was faced with, okay, am I going to just kind of, uh, do I really believe what I've always said? Because my I, I have two um, uncles who were born and raised in the church, served missions, and then had left the church and then were openly gay and had partners. And I think it was just uh, far away enough from my kind of just, just my idea of, I don't know, just the fact that it was my sister was different. Um and I, I, I think I was able to think long, uh, fr- uh, I was able to think love the sin or hate the sin type of an idea or like, or whatever, uh, with some extended family, which I feel bad about now, but that was just kind of where I was. Um, but w- when it was my sister, uh, it was just super close to home. This is my, you know, nearly, uh, you know, we're just 12 or 14 months apart. Uh, we're very close. And she's happy. So what's going on? That's kind of what happened in my head. Um, and so so that that was, um, yeah, that was October of 2018. And then Madison and I meet in the most Mormon way possible, times two. Because, so we meet in, our, our first day is in February of 2019. So four months later. But we meet the story starts at a different time depending on which one you ask which one of us you ask but we we matched on the mormon dating app mutual mutual um while we were also in the same ysa ward young single adult ward in provo (laughs) um the fact that we were in the same ward i did not know until after we had matched and talked a little bit and then (laughs) we swapped uh some social media handles and i was like oh we follow a lot of the same people and she's like oh are you in the in this? Are you in the ninety ninth ward? I had to pretend like I didn't know, um, and because I didn't want to be creepy. Yeah, and sh- I was like, "Yeah," she's like, "Oh, me too. That's crazy." Um, but if you want to jump in quickly to share, who did you both follow on social media? I'm just curious. Just um, like people in our ward. Yeah, just oh, people okay. in our oh, ward. So I was like, "So how do you know this person? This person?" And she's like, like "They're oh. in my ward." And, and I was like, "Wait, so yeah. are we in the okay. same ward?" Okay. Um, That's so, pretty Mormon. Provo, yeah. YSA ward. Mutual, Mutual app. Yep. It was, Pretty yeah. Mormon. Yeah. And yeah. to top it all off, our first date was at a comedy show at BYU. Oh, I thought you'd say bowling alley or something. No, no. no. Featuring, Not though. Quite. I'm old. That's what we did back then. Um, fe- uh, the comedy show did feature uh, Dan Bam Bam, yeah. Daniel Spencer. What? While yeah. he was there. Well, yeah. he, his episode's premiering today. Oh, well, yeah. There you go. How in the world are the stars aligning? <laughs> right? Yep, that and was so our first Samantha date. Samantha co-hosted that one and brought it to us. So. Look nice. at that. I, it, I think... Secular divine is blessing Mormon <laughs> yeah, stories look at that. right now. I there would you have go. to agree. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so we... What was he like? What was Dan... Oh, just Dan funny. He was hilarious. Hilarious. And yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he told a bit where um, he went on a, a date with a girl, and the girl thought he was also a girl. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so he went on a date with a, a lesbian while she also thought he was a lesbian. And it's just a funny story. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it, it was a, um, yeah, a, a BYU sponsored, uh, Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day, Day theme. <laughs> so they all yeah. told like bad date stories. Um, yeah. And then we went and got ice cream and, oh my gosh. And, yeah. uh, you know, on Very Center Street. Very typical. It was, yeah. Mormon it was, YSA. There was a Hallmark yeah. slash LDS church, uh, collaboration. I think it would look just like our. First, yeah. first date. I love it. Um, and so yeah, so we um, we started dating, um, and somewhere around this time as well, <coughs> um, my family uh, lives. I, I was in Provo. My family lives in, in Cedar Hills, Utah, about twenty minutes away. So every Sunday, I was up there for family dinner. We all were. Um, and one of these Sundays, my mom. Uh, wanted to pull each of us aside to tell us something, um, which was out of the ordinary. And she wanted to see each of us just one by one. Um, 
And she told us um, that she had been going through a faith crisis. Um, and when she was telling us this, it was near a point of her own faith crisis where she was either unsure or disbelieving in most Mormon teachings. Um, and this was quite a shock um, to me. Um, but I think if I could have planned it, I don't think I could have planned it any better because I had kind of started my own little faith crisis of uh, or asking questions. And so when she, she tell you kind of what led to it and what it was about, um, or she yeah, keep all the details from you? Uh, no. So she shared it all. Um, she, what really, um, kind of kicked it off was, um, hearing a story about polygamy, um, hearing someone specifically bear testimony about how awesome polygamy was and kind of is. Um, and <clears throat> it, she was like, I don't think that at all. Um, started kind of digging into the history of polygamy and that led to another thing and another thing. And, um, so yeah, it, w it was more like church history, um, polygamy stuff that led to a deeper is God even there kind of a uh, place is where she got to mm, eventually. Okay. Yeah. What was that like for you? Um, so it, yeah, it was very surprising, um, to me, but, um, for whatever reason, just that I think there was a shift when my sister came out to me where it wasn't as much of a, ca a catastrophe where, um, it wasn't like when I had viewed pornography that one time, all of a sudden no empty chairs is ruined. When she told me about her faith crisis, I was like, okay, um, that's where she is. And I didn't have any thoughts in my head as far as I can remember of like, I hope she like resolves it all and can see the truth or whatever. Um, cause I was in a, a place of questioning too. So honestly for, you know, in some respects I was like, Oh, thank goodness. There's someone else. Mm. There's, there's some discord where I, I can say to someone, I don't know if I really believe this. And that person will say, yeah, me neither. Or at least be understanding. And that person also happens to be my mom, which is, a, you know, a great place because I know of too many horror stories of you go and you share that information that your testimony is not super, super strong with your parents. And that's a really bad result. So this was kind of flipped where she shared it with us. And honestly, and she shared with us that she was scared to tell us. Um, but none of us came out with, oh, no, this is the end kind of thoughts. As far as I know, uh, we did discuss it as siblings. Like, so what was that like about? Like, that was wild. But none, none of us were like, at least to each other, like, man, let's hope she figures it out and comes around. Um, we you know, openly supported her of trying to figure out life and kind of where she stood with stuff. Um, but for me, it did kind of open up some permission kind of so consciously of like, okay, um, I'm allowed to question and doubt and not be so sure. And it's okay. Cause it was acceptable in my family. I felt confident <coughs> that I could kind of go that route. of just asking questions and not, not know everything. Yeah, totally. Okay. All right. So that's, I, I don't know. It's rare and warmest stories to have someone in their faith crisis sort of journey to uh, to have them tell that part that their parent kind of comes out before them, and I'm really happy for you that that idea that you said thank goodness makes total sense, just takes so much pressure off. But then also then no empty chairs. So did you do you remember like hey mom what about no empty chairs like um, maybe that came later I, I that's just what comes to my mind yeah yeah and that'll co that'll come up later but I think for me the biggest thing I kind of I, I viewed more of like. Uh, that grace had kind of started it off. Um, and not, not to be like grace ruined it or anything, but just kind of put it into question of like, what does this all mean? Like, what does, because, you know, no empty chairs for us for so long was like faithful Mormonism. This is the right way. This is the best way to live. And when I saw my sister be so happy about uh, living in a non-Mormon way, even if it was just the slightest, because even her at the time, she was still trying to go to church too. So on her own, she was on her own journey, but there was this, it was just this pure joy that she was so happy about this experience of connecting with someone. Um, 
that I, you know, there was the, the, the no empty chairs thing was starting to soften. Its foundation was a little crumbly. Um, so, so yeah, the, it, there wasn't a whole, a big shock with, with my mom being like, okay, mom, what does this mean now? You've ruined it or whatever. Um, there's already some movement. So, um, so Madison and I meet, um, and we start dating, um, and you can feel free to jump in and correct me at any time. You're good. Um, but there was a pretty clear expectation and plan to, to date and, or, or when, when we first exchanged, I love yous and that turned into an engagement. The end goal was a (coughs) temple, a temple marriage. That was, without question, the the plan. I don't even think it was something that was, like, discussed. I think it was just, we both are Mormon. We, you know, that's what you do. You get married in the temple. And it was always an expectation for me. Um, Like, I had never even gone on a date with someone who wasn't LDS. Um, But, yeah, we... I don't even think we really had a conversation about it. I think we were like, okay, so what temple are we going to get married in? Kind of conversation. <clears throat> but, yeah. Yeah, and, and we had we had shared with each other um, our more, I don't know if it, uh, nuance is the right word at that time, but just kind of differing beliefs. Because, again, my sister had come out, and I was supportive of that, and so was Madison. She was like, oh, awesome. Um, and so we were, we were like-minded in where we differed from super traditional Orthodox Mormonism. Um, and honestly, I think that was one, I mean, again, this will probably pop up later, but just, we agreed a lot on just life stuff. Um, and yeah, we, neither of us were super, I don't know, like we were, we shared like our our thoughts on Mormon stuff and maybe where we differed and we were not just like okay with it but like supportive of like okay awesome like I think that way too or whatever um there was one moment and I'll I'll share this because this embarrasses me um but we were we were driving to um oh. <laughs> yeah we're driving to a grocery store to get like treats or something for like a movie night and Madison had a coffee cup in uh her side door and I, and I honestly, I didn't see it or anything, but she was like, yep, I drank <laughs> coffee today and I don't care that I did. I was in my rebellious phase where I was just, I didn't care. But. And I, I like kind of panicked a little. I was like, oh no, like that's, <laughs> that, that kind of behavior ruins a temple marriage. Like you can't get married in the temple if you break the word of wisdom and drinking <clears throat> coffee is breaking the word, word of wisdom. And so I mentioned, like, we got to the parking lot, and I mentioned that. I was like, well, you know, like, you know, you, you can't do, you can't He's like, we that. can't get married in the temple, temple if you're you, going to drink coffee. Yeah, and that uh, that ruined the whole night, you know. <laughs> I uh, drove him back home. Yeah, she's like, said, get out of yeah, my she car. said, we're not getting treats anymore. I was like, we just drove oh, to yeah, Smith's. <laughs> I was like, it's right there. She's like, no. Well, no, because this is what you said. You have. I showed you the coffee cup and I said, I, I drink coffee. And then you said, well, I want to get married in the temple. And I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then I drove you home. Yeah. Which was a fair response. Um, <laughs> it's a vibe kill. Healthy balance. Yeah. yeah. You know, right. That doesn't really no, but make... No, but like you're, you're being self-effacing here and kind of like, but for me, that might've been a deal killer. I oh, might've yeah. just, I might've fired Margie as as my girlfriend and said we're done that's yeah. a, that's actually like in 2022 that is starting to sound silly what your reaction but in 1993 yeah. it would have been a done deal bye bye margie you know what i mean yeah yeah and i you know and uh you know personally that was the that was probably the physically closest i've ever been to a cup of coffee coffee in my life <laughs> too so um yeah and so i was it it did send me into a panic i was like oh you know coffee is step one and then (laughs) ted bundy is i'm just kidding (laughs) um but like i you know it was a it was a big panic and so i i thought what i had said was like the like kind of the nicer version of like how i was feeling um why are you so indignant like you know the rules no no, but i i yeah i was like 
this ruins like the all the plans of you know and then yeah you drove me home and was just like yeah kind of deal with it a little bit yeah um how, wait Madison how were you justifying your indignation in your mind I have no idea because <laughs> I knew that it was against the rules I just I think at that point I didn't really care I was I had always thought like the no coffee no hot drinks whatever was a stupid rule like I grew up thinking that and like my parents had never I mean I was a sneaky kid so I drank coffee in high school like my school had like a cafe or whatever and so I would just drink it at high school are we talking school. lattes or are we talking yeah. black or what like lattes okay, I'm not okay. I'm not like definitely not in the black coffee but okay. um so yeah that was just something that I and I lied to my bishop about it to get my temple recommend like I just <laughs> was like whatever and here's the other thing is that when so I got my patriarchal blessing when I was 14 and I was viewing pornography at that time and I <clears throat> was convinced that the what do they call them the patriarch is that what they're called mm -hmm person giving me the blessing was going to know that I was sinning and I was like if he knows he's gonna say it in my blessing for sure and he obviously didn't say it because he didn't know and so that's kind of when I just started lying to my bishop and to my leaders and stuff if I was following the rules because I was like they're not gonna know the only person that knows is me and I don't think God cares because he didn't tell the patriarch that I was sinning when or he's never told my bishop my bishop's never taken my temple recommend away and if he knew then he would so, <laughs> so yeah i i am just i have to call it that um this point in your story believe it or not feels very important to me as something to highlight in the 2022 context because mm -hmm. in 2022 the mormon church is hemorrhaging in the developed world in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, it's hemorrhaging. And it's, it's mostly hemorrhaging its millennials and its Gen Z mm -hmm. populations. And, you know, it's true that religion's on the ropes in generally Christianity's on the ropes generally, but Mormonism just as much. And one of the main reasons are, well, some of the main reasons are the LGBT issue, and then kind of like stupid strict rules that millennials and Gen Zers are just like, this is dumb. Mm -hmm. It's not like, who did Joseph Smith, you know, what was, who's Fanny Alger? What about Book of Abraham? Kinderhook plates, what are those? None of that. Mm -hmm. It's like the church is a bigot towards LGBT people and these rules are dumb and they don't make sense. Yeah. And, and I'm only calling that out because <clears throat> not only is your, is your mom your mom's lost her faith by this point, Tommy. Mm -hmm. Your your mom is what by this point? I think she was still trying, but definitely was. She's on the ropes. Yeah. And so the many of the parents are on the ropes. Mm -hmm. And then the kids are just starting to be confronted with, the, the, oh, you met an LGBT person. If you're not bisexual or gender fluid yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's just taking people out. You know yeah. what I mean? I don't, I don't mean to get too exuberant, but we're talking about the hemorrhaging of the Mormon church in, in, in the modern era. Yeah. And this is like how it starts, right? This is ground zero for, yeah. for Mormon hemorrhaging in the 21st century, right yeah. where we are in your story. And I think for me, it was the fact that I drank coffee and nothing happened. So therefore it was like, okay, is this rule really that important? It obviously can't be because, you know, I'm not getting struck by lightning. My bishop, doesn't take away my temple recommend because he doesn't get revelation that I am drinking coffee at, on my lunch breaks. Like, so I just, and even growing up, I was always like, I want a reason as to why I'm doing things. I was that, I was that kid who was super annoying and would just be like, why, 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 why? And nobody could give me an answer. And that really made me mad. Um, and I just felt like I was blindly following something that I didn't understand why and so yeah that's kind of where it started for me was breaking small rules and not having consequences for it because yeah. they were dumb rules <laughs> so yeah. but yeah yeah okay 
Yeah, and just to kind of just to frame it to where I was, I, you mentioned like you would withhold information from bishops. I was an oversharer. I had I would text bishops stuff, be like hey, just like you know, like <laughs> do to do, and they'd be like, oh, okay, texting him what? <laughs> uh, well, so like pornography was still like a a thing going on, and so, um, e- or even if I maybe thought about viewing pornography, just like just so you know, like I kind of wanted to. And and I'm texting like a, a some you know again uh, you know these are not full time jobs so this you know it's he's a, getting a text yeah, at nine thirty yeah, at night yeah he's a dad yeah. he just put his kids to bed some twenty two year old in his congregation just just like texted him and I'm sure he's like I gotta wake up in the morning I have like meetings my guy like what are you doing <laughs> um, but yeah just to kind of put those two things uh, or kind of just the differences between the two yeah. of us. You know, you saw the cup of coffee and was like, yeah, I tried it and I'm still alive. <laughs> and I see the cup of coffee and I'm like, that could deny you eternal happiness with me if we get married. That's a big deal. Um, and so, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's just one, one instance. And I, c- you know, I don't remember everything on how I kind of mentally resolved that. Clearly, I, you know, we're, we're still here and we ended up getting uh, married in the temple and I kept drinking coffee. Really? Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's interesting that that you could stay faithful yeah. and keep drinking coffee and lie, but <laughs> somehow not feel like a horrible person. Yeah. Which and that Tommy, you would know, and that you would know that she's lying and still get married. I mean, and that's not a judgment thing yeah, at no. all because I think a lot of people live that way in the modern yeah. era. I think what it was is that I had a lot of guilt about other things. Like I had the guilt about my parents and their divorce and all of that. And so that was just something I felt like it was something that I could control and I wasn't feeling guilty about it. And that made me feel good because I had grown up with all of this guilt and all of the shame that like these small things paled in comparison to these big things that I was feeling shame and guilt about. So I think that's probably what it was, but who knows? I'm psycho an- psychoanalyzing myself. Uh, and and for me, um, <clears throat> what allowed me to kind of, I'll just say, kind of, uh, you know, forget or not care, you know, about the coffee drinking or whatever. Um, I very much uh, involved uh, God like through prayer with my relationships. I never told anyone God told me to break up with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm grateful for past Tommy uh, for that. But um, I would always be like, okay, is this someone that I could, I should keep dating? Like I would just present that question to God in prayer. Um, and when I would ask about Madison, I felt super great. And so I, I took that, that took uh, more of a uh, authority than anything else. So I was like, well, God, I feel, I'm feeling confident that God is like, yeah, go ahead with this. So... That's that's the plan. So if Madison still wants to get married and, and she does whatever she does, uh, God said it was good. So um, yeah, I took his that kind of personal revelation authority over any sort of temple recommend interview, and it's not like we discussed. You weren't like, "Hey, I'm going to go in and just like fib about it no. or anything." It was just like, "Okay, she went in and she came out, and we're good to go." And yeah, yeah, <laughs> that shift. To internal authority that you both made prior to getting married is, is in my generation, I think relatively rare, <clears throat> rare, and it's pretty significant. You were nodding your head, Samantha. Yeah, I feel like that whole conference review we just did, it felt like so much of the last conference was a reaction to people like developing inner authority and mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's a big deal. So guys. that's, it's kind of a optimal way to start a Mormon marriage where instead of being uptight and afraid and like strict and rigid with each other, you're kind of like, Hey, let's do this. And let's not be too up. Let's not be too uptight about it. Yeah. Let's get married Mormon, but let's be chill and drink some coffee. And don't you think it's somewhat rare for Mormons to enter into marriage with like allowing for the other to have that much autonomy? Cause it is kind of a big thing. Coffee, you know, it represents a lot. Yeah. That feels like so much healthier than we're used to. I don't think I've ever heard this part of a Mormon story in 1700 
hours of <laughs> 2000 hours of Mormon stories. I don't think I've ever heard this pre-marriage dynamic before. I don't think. Yeah. I think we had a really good dynamic while we were dating. And I think a big part of it is because I've always been super independent. I, and well, I shouldn't say I always have been because when I was dating pre Tommy, I was very not independent. I was very codependent on whoever I was dating. And I think a lot of that was because I was dealing with trauma with my parents' divorce and just childhood trauma, whatever. And I think when, and I don't want this to sound mean, but when Tommy and I were dating, I was not like crazy about him at first. Whereas in my past relationships, I would fall super quickly and super hard and I would be devastated when we broke up. But what I liked about mine and Tommy's relationship and what obviously ended up working because now we're married is that I was able to keep my independence while we were still dating. And even though we hung out all the time, like we literally saw each other every day, but I was still like, I didn't feel like I needed him. And he allowed me to make my own decisions and choose what was going to be best for myself. And yeah, I think we just, we had a really good dynamic dating and we also were not afraid to talk about hard things. So like when we were dating, we would have conversations all the time about like, what would life look like with our kids? What would life look like if you lost your job? What would it like? And that is not something I had ever experienced in a relation in a relationship before. It was always just like, okay, you'll go to work and you'll take care of me and I'll have kids and whatever. It was very stereotypical Mormon family. Whereas mine and Tommy's relationship was a lot different. But yeah. Do you feel like those other dating experiences like helped you grow up in that way? Because this sounds like a more like mature Mm -hmm. version of dating compared to before. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, therapy was huge for me. I was going to therapy before I dated, before I met Tommy and then while we were dating and then continuing on into like our first year of marriage and it helped tremendously. Um, And yeah, I think just going through therapy and learning how to um, not be codependent because that was a huge problem in my parents' marriage was that my mom was a hundred percent dependent on my dad. And so when they got divorced, um, she had to go back to school. She had to find a job. She didn't have savings. She had debt, like all this stuff. And now her life is like wrecked because she's divorced. And I did not want that for myself. Um, and so that's what I appreciated in our relationship. And I didn't realize that that was something that I needed when I was dating other people, Um, probably because they didn't allow me to be independent. Um, but yeah, therapy. (laughs) That's what I tell everyone. Therapy is the answer to everything. In some ways, this is, I think the, the Mormon church would do better to have more couples enter into marriage with this mindset Mm -hmm. because it allows you to be flexible. Yeah. Instead of being rigid and breaking quickly, you can bend and be flexible but I'm dying to know how your story unfolds because now you're entering into a Mormon marriage with a lot of relaxed flexibility that I'm thinking, Mm -hmm. what could ever go wrong? You just, you've claimed your internal authority now so you can just be whoever you want to be and be Mormon forever. So that's, that's where, that's where I'm curious now. (laughs) Yeah. um, Yeah. So we, we meet, date, get engaged and get married uh, in seven months. All no. The, Nine months. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, it was from February to September. Nine minus two is... Eight. Split okay. the difference. It is eight. Seven, seven, eight, or nine months. <sighs> One of those numbers. I uh, hate that it was so short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fine. Almost it worked a, out. Almost a year. We'll, we'll round up. Year. We'll round up. It was a year. Um... Uh, but we, you know, we fell for each other pretty quickly, obviously. Um, and so, yeah, so we get uh, married at the end of September of 2019. Um, and pretty pretty soon after that, I, I remember um, a conversation that we had um, as we were trying to fall asleep. 
um, you had mentioned uh, that you weren't that if you mentioned that you didn't know if the church was true. And that specific conversation, um, I was like, oh no. Oh, um, because although I had been around um, faith crises and was kind of having my own of kind of a shifting of b- belief, a complete, the, I don't think the church is true belief, I, that was new. So this was like another new thing. And for me, that was kind of like the foundation. Like these other things, like, you know, obviously the coffee thing I was like fine with, but with the whole church being not true, that was like new for me. And that, that for me really affected the whole eternal, what does this mean for our eternities? Like we just got sealed like a month ago. If you don't believe it anymore, then what does that mean? And I, and at that point I wasn't, fully convinced that the only way was full Mormonism active, but I just didn't know what the other options could be. And I was scared to enter that thought process. I really wanted just to Mormon our way till death. Mm-hmm. At least we're sealed and everything's good. But now she's like, maybe it's not true. I was like, Oh no, the, the plan, my plan that I didn't ever say out loud <laughs> uh, is sure. being ruined. Yeah. Uh, it had the potential of kind of exploding. Um, that was, that was really scary for me. And I remember calling my parents the next day because I knew about my parents' situation and I was like, okay, so what do I have to do? Like, what does this mean now? And of course they're like, uh, it's your marriage. Like, I don't know. Like, I mean, and they had advice, but I was hoping that they'd be like, just read this and then do this for the Show song her or this. this or whatever. <laughs> and it wasn't like that. And I was, yeah, I was really spooked. Is there anything you want to add to the <clears throat> conversation? Um, how early into our marriage was that conversation? Because I don't remember that conversation. Um, it was, um, it was like one night, and I think actually the day after you were like, I don't know, I was just kind of like tired, and it's true, and I kind of, uh. kind of resolved <laughs> a little bit. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe it's all that coffee you were drinking, <laughs> you know, it's keeping me up at night, but um. I mean, I have had doubts about the church, I mean, since I went through the temple, which was in October of 2018, um, so before I even met Tommy, and I I know that I had expressed to him my discomfort with the temple, and we had shared kind of similar stories about, because Tommy and I were not temple goers. Like we got, we didn't go to the temple while we were dating. We got married in the temple and then we haven't gone since. So it just like, we're not like those people that go every month or whatever. Um, And so I know that I had shared like little bits and pieces as I was feeling them um, with Tommy. So that I totally could have had that conversation and just not remember it because I was, I feel like I was constantly being like, I feel this way today. I feel this because I don't know. I, I never had that like aha moment of like the church is not true anymore. Like it was, it came in bits and pieces over the course of two, three years. And I think I was constantly sharing them with him. And yeah, there was definitely not a lack of communication in my doubts throughout our marriage. Tell me, had both your parents left by this point? Uh, uh, so, uh, no. Um, my dad uh, has always believed and still uh, continues to believe. Um, and my my mom, um, her her beliefs have shifted. She still goes to church, um, but is quite unorthodox in her beliefs. Okay. Um, yeah. That's and I, curious. and I don't feel confident enough to try to explain sure. decisions yeah. of other people. Um, yeah. but yeah, that's kind of where yeah. they both okay. sit at. Yeah. So on the one hand, I'm envying your marriage because it just takes so much intensity off the table or rigidity. On the other hand, it's not the gung ho. We're going to do, mm-hmm. we're going to no empty chairs. 
we're going to rock this Mormon marriage into the eternities. <laughs> it's just constant like processing and doubts and like, what does this mean? Yeah. So it's kind of a sluggish Mormon, early Mormon marriage in terms of the religiosity yeah. piece. Right. Yeah. I and think confusing. that, <laughs> um, that a hundred percent helped when I finally decided I was like, okay, I'm done it wasn't like this huge explosion and it wasn't like Tommy's world is just completely rocked and just over. Like, you know, because I had been sharing these thoughts and feelings for the past two years, it wasn't a shock to him. I mean, it was, there was a little bit of a shock factor. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't like I'm going to church and attending the temple and doing all the right things to all of a sudden I'm going to leave the church now. So before we, should we talk, should we talk about your faith crisis or is there anything else in your story leading up to your faith crisis that needs to be mentioned other than just a couple years of marriage? Um, just, just real quickly. Um, so I, I could sense that there was, a, there was an obvious change in my beliefs and I, I feel like I could go one of two ways. I could either, fit it into a nuanced progressive Mormonism route or leave and kind of start deconstructing with the, with the end result kind of leaving the faith. And I did not want to leave whatsoever. So I just completely leaned into a progressive nuanced Mormonism. Um, I myself, I mean, I, again, I, I didn't, you know, drink, I, I didn't have any like nuance for, personal views of how I was going to interpret the gospel. I personally was still pretty orthodox, so like word of wisdom, keeping it. Uh, I was going to church, um, believed in the Book of Mormon, personally believed all this stuff, but I absolutely allowed for, um, like I was, I didn't think LGBTQ um, people were either uh, anything negative, you know, the messaging of the negativity changes throughout the church's history. But, um, you know, like I didn't think that the, I didn't find the, you know, them falling in love to be sinful. Um, I thought that the, just honestly, some classic progressive Mormonism, like the priesthood ban, not revelatory, uh, Brigham Young's racism, uh, did that. The, the revelation to bring it back, was more of just an agreement by all 15 in charge to, they all finally were all chill with it. That wasn't a revelation. Um, so I, I was in that wave of Mormonism. Um, we'll call it the Dr. Hanks Mormonism. I, I, I feel bad invoking her name, but just a little bit kind of like that, making, seeing issues, trying to figure out issues, but definitely committed to staying in the faith. Okay, so let's go there really quick because, like, I, re I remember thinking that I might have, and this is just in my brain, like, I remember having the thought when I started to talk about Orthodox or unorthodox Mormonism, mm -hmm. I don't know, 18 years ago, like, I remember thinking, am I the first person to ever even use those words in a Mormon context? Mm -hmm. And that may sound weird to people, but within Mormonism, there's no such thing as unorthodox or, or orthodox. Yeah, there's no. They don't even know what that it. word means. You're yeah. just either devout and you're Mormon, or you're like an anti-Mormon or a Jack Mormon or never Mormon. There's nothing in between. Am mm -hmm. I wrong? No. It's so 100 yeah. percent right. Yeah. So this idea of an and let's just distinguish. Orthodox means you believe in a traditional way. Orthoprax would mean you you do all the things you're supposed to do as a Mormon. So you would you would be unorthoprax mm -hmm. in your Mormonism at the time you're married, Madison, because you're drinking coffee. Yeah. That's unorthodox, right? Mm -hmm. Or that's unorthoprax. Mm -hmm. And then you're talking about unorthodox, which means my beliefs are going to be different than what the brethren are teaching. So let's just talk briefly about like how would that, knowing that that has like never been a thing until it's a modern, it's a relatively modern thing. How would you even know that there was the option of being unorthodox? Mm -hmm. And then what would be your community or your channels or your sources of information that would model the possibility of unorthodoxy? Yeah, so honestly, um, channels and community was on social media. 
Um, Where though? Uh, Twitter, I think, was a big one. Um, honestly, like fellow millennials and probably Gen Zers at the time too, just um, creating um, a, just this space to exist and like affirming that space and being like, okay, th- you can do both. You can be a practicing Mormon and think that same sex marriage is totally fine. Okay, so I'm just I'm geeking out here. Yeah, no, I love to yeah. geek out. So like five or ten years ago, you would you would listen to Dan Witherspoon's Mormon Matters podcast. That's the way you'd be introduced. To, well, first you would listen to Mormon stories back when <laughs> I was still in the church and doing the progressive Mormon mm-hmm. thing. You would read the Stay LDS website, which I wrote, which would tell you how to stay in the church as a semi or non believer, or you would you would listen to Dan Witherspoon's Mormon Matters or his successor Gina Colvin. She took over Mormon Matters from Dan. Or you would join the A Thoughtful Faith Facebook group, which then changed its name, that which I started, which changed to uh, Waters of Mormon mm-hmm. because they wanted to d- disassociate from me after my excommunication. So they changed the name. And this was a way that, let's just say five or ten years ago, you would, or, or you would go to Sunstone or Dialogue. You you'd go to Sunstone conferences or read Dialogue Journal. And these were ways that you could discover liberal, progressive, and orthodox Mormonism and or join communities. But it, none of that was part of your journey, right? So, uh, well, Waters of Mormon, yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, I, I didn't know it pre-John. Uh, so just just Waters of Mormon. Yeah. Um, I would read stuff from Dialogue um, because it sounded like me. Uh-huh. You know, I felt comfortable in that space. But there were just a lot of self- declared progressive Mormons on the, on the online, just kind of in that space. So um, like you're following Twitter, can you name some of the big Twitter accounts that model or that we're modeling? Cause all these, a lot of these people end up leaving the church, but at least at the time, can you think of any of the big names either on Twitter or elsewhere who were kind of modeling progressive Mormonism? Yeah. I mean, um, today it is Dr. Julie Hank. She's like a giant. Yeah. But you know, um, three years ago she wasn't as big. Yeah, and I'm you know I'm trying to think and and I I really do think I I I honestly look kind of inward toward um, like my mom. I was like, well, she's making it work in a, a way. Um, I felt comfortable just kind of doing that. I also, um, yeah, I you know I feel bad. I mean, there are people. But I oh, think, okay. well, so one one that was um, a big one for me was uh, uh, Richard Osler's podcast, right? Mm-hmm. And just being We'll include to, all these in the show notes, too. Yeah. Listen, Listen Learn, Learn, and Love. love. Mm-hmm. And he's got a pro-LGBT faithful Mormon podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. Papa Osler. Papa Osler is yeah. kind of his, his nickname. And he's the brother of David Osler, who I've also had on Mormon Stories, who wrote the Bridges book, which is about how to treat your non-believing Mormon family members as a believing Mormon, which is a great book. And we'll include a link to that as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so the Oslers mm-hmm. were influential to you. Yeah. They played a role. And I also, I, I, I dove deep cause I, I still had a sense of authority like that. I needed um, to hear stuff that was either said over the pulpit at one point or currently. And so I, 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 I became a big QB Brown fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say that, cautiously because i don't know everything he's ever said and i don't know i don't want to tie myself directly to him but there were plenty of stuff where he was like talked about doubting and um coupling that with faith but he he wasn't i didn't find him to be afraid of talking about doubts and um he was i think he's canadian as well Uh uh-huh and there were a lot of kind of liberal more liberal leaning and more open to just kind of non-orthodox kind of Canadian because it's you know so shout out Canada um but yeah so I, I I found quotes and stuff that I felt good with and I would compile them and like um yeah so like and, and stuff maybe from um you know President Uchtdorf that was more <laughs> soft you know one um, of the patron saints of modern progressive liberal Mormonism exactly yeah. you know so I you know I I, I did pick and choose the stuff that felt nice and and allowed for me to be um, 
what I felt was a, a faithful progressive Mormon. And it, it was faithful in the sense that I was paying tithing, I was going to church, I believed in all the things to a degree. Um, I was keeping all the word of wisdom, I was temple worthy, while also um, being okay with other people not and like supporting that too. And I felt that's, that's kind of, to me, that's kind of the, the tagline of progressive Mormonism is I'm Mormon and you're not, and we're both correct or we're both right and we're both happy and I'm not going to try to convince you to become Mormon. That's kind of how I felt was like, I'm happy with whatever anyone else does. I'm here in my little lane and it feels good right now. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And then there's, then there's the ex-Mormons <clears throat> out there. Me, Mormon Stories, Bill Real, um, you know, Raider Free Mormon and others. And I find that sometimes some of my biggest haters are progressive Mormons. So how did you view, did you like flirt with the ex-Mormon stuff or did you like hate it and, and stay away from it? So to feel like I, other people, I, to find people that I could relate to, I would listen slash watch to, or watch Mormon stories, like four fifths of a video. I would end the podcast before they <laughs> left. So I'd be like, okay, so these people, these people have all read the CES letter. These people have all, they know the church history stuff. They made it work for a time. And then they go like, but then this, and then boop, new video or new what podcast. I would cut it off. Um, and, uh, you no, know, I don't have any specific, you know, thoughts or whatever, but I definitely, I mean, I would hear stuff from ex Mormons that would talk about how they felt like progressive Mormonism was maybe more hurtful than helpful. Um, cause it kept, you know, an institution that they viewed to be ultimately hurtful alive. Um, and that would upset me. Cause I'd be like, I'm right here. Like I'm doing it. Like it's totally fine. And I'm whatever. So I wasn't like, anti ex Mormon or whatever, but I definitely did not appreciate some of the sentiments because I, I was like, I'm making it work and I'm not a bad person and whatever because I would maybe hear some of that. Um but yeah, so I mean I I can I, I yeah, I, I do have memories of listening or watching to most of a stories episode on purpose and then closing it out before they left <laughs> because I didn't want to hear it honestly because I knew that it would probably do something to Plant me. some seeds. Yeah, and I just, I just, I, I don't think I was ready, and I just didn't, slash I didn't want it at that time, so I just, I would consciously swipe out and go to something completely unrelated to kind of, like, just chill Plans out my mind. The power. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and was that section of people's stories, like, comforting to you? Like, what did you get out of it? Yeah, so I felt like, yeah, it was 100% comforting. That was the, mo <clears throat> the motivation, was people who knew stuff that I knew and felt like it was a problem because I would go to like fair Mormon and they're talking about the stuff that I know. But by the end of the article, it was like, but it's totally like kind of chill and fine. And there was stuff that I didn't think was chill and fine. So I was trying to find people who were just like me that knew like issues within the church history or, or historical or current and didn't feel great about it, but stayed. And that, didn't offer a lot. So I had to make up my own, which was a four fifths of a Mormon <laughs> stories podcast. And part of why I'm smiling so big is because the first time I ever saw any of your TikTok content, I think you did a TikTok making fun of how long Mormon stories episodes were, <laughs> but you were listening to four fifths of them, right? And they Absolutely. were helping you, right? Well, yeah. So I, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So in that specific TikTok, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, I, I make fun of two things. I make fun out of the name, how it's Mormon stories, because I pretend to be interested. I think I, I say, hi, I'm John DeLynn. Um, <laughs> and welcome to ex-Mormon stories. And I'm like, wait, it's Mormon stories? Oh, for SEO purposes? Is what I say. <laughs> because that's how I stumbled across it the first time. So that was like an inside joke to myself. Um, and then I do say, all right, now tell us your story. And the person's story is, I used to be Mormon, but now I'm not. And then I pretend to be you and I cut them off and say, okay, do that, but take like three or four hours to do it. <laughs> and I remember I did this all, I did this John. all so carefully. I, 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 I put that on there and in the caption, I was like, like it or not, 
they are long. That's just like an objective <laughs> fact. So I did. I tried very hard not to <clears throat> to not have it be like they're long and that's dumb, <laughs> or like that's long and that's awesome. It's just like they're long. They're long. They are and I long. and I because I knew that I had followers who thought that like yeah, and those are dumb. But also like yeah, and that's great that they're long. So I was trying to just make everyone happy, and I also for SEO, for the SEO. For <laughs> SEO purposes, I was trying to just make everyone happy. But also, um, I didn't think I thought the fact that you know I was poking fun at the length thing was just my own attention span or whatever. But also, yeah, I would watch. You know, yeah, that wasn't my. I wasn't um, hiding the you know the fact that I listened to them or whatever. Um, but yeah. I mean, on the one hand, humor's awesome and I love it and I love people making fun of me. There is a weird dynamic in what I do because there's there is a common trajectory and it starts with orthodox and then it's doubting and then it's often progressive and then they leave the church. But sometimes in that orthodox phase, people write me these emails like, you're an evil person. You are worse than Satan. I can't believe how you tear people's faith from their clutches and... Ruined families, you know, Never and then I just wait. Never seen you do that wait. voice before. What's that? <laughs> Never seen you do that voice before. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then you, I mean, that, that's what the voice I hear in my head when mm. I'm reading their Facebook message to me. Yeah. But then like, sometimes you wait like three years and then you get mm -hmm. the message, which is like, John, I, I just have to tell you, I'm just so, so sorry for that <laughs> message I sent you. I love those and, DMs. <laughs> and, then, and it's not like I'm like, ha ha, you know, like laughing back, but it is, it's kind of interesting to see people's trajectory yeah, yeah. And their i think they react most strongly when something has hit them that is shaking them up that's when i feel like people are most likely to send just the most unhinged messages yeah oh yeah like their spouse tells them they're leaving or their kid does a gender transition and they're just mm -hmm. super angry and they need someone to blame yeah because if they're really secure it's they're just like oh anti-mormons who cares yeah. i had this woman i had this woman send me a, a dm on instagram the other day and it was just like have fun ruining people's eternal salvation, oh. John DeLynn. My niece just did a gender transition and had surgery and deformed her beautiful body. And oh. I was just like, whoa, like, you're first of all, you're putting all that on me. And second of all, worst aunt ever. Like, yeah. you're going to wreck this human's life. Like, can you just, you know, but it's just like, like you said, Samantha, mm. she in her world, the worst possible things are happening. Yeah. Because it, like Mormons aren't taught how to really like healthily process emotions outside the, con you know, they're taught to just process everything through the church and be psychologically dependent on that. So when something threatens that, it's like they got to displace it somewhere. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you're upset about something? Go read the scriptures. Go pray. Mm. It's like, mm -hmm. okay. Or maybe do something else. Yeah. <laughs> like maybe a therapist. Yeah. Like get some that. healthy coping mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, like, this is just so many people's journey. And that's why I like to slow down and talk about it, just because mm -hmm. you're going to be, your story is going to help other people feel validated. And so many Gen Z or millennial people are going to really relate to this exact story. So, yeah. Thanks for being willing to talk about it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 And, and just in, in that same line of thinking, there are definitely, um, like I've I've said comments on videos or posts or whatever talking bad pro about you and Mormon stories and been like, yeah, John Delin did to do <laughs> because at the time what were you feeling? Because yeah, so one so yeah so my my a lot of my mom's faith stuff, um, within that journey did include Mormon stories, and you're you're the face of Mormon stories. You're you're the person you know you're the person, and so just a lot of just ill feelings sometimes because like I mentioned overall I was my mom coming to me with a faith crisis and all that was uh there was a lot of positivity in there um but then you know just things happen and there's days and there's moments and it's your it's your fault of course <laughs> um and because on the one hand your mom's when you when your mom came out to you your words were th well, thank goodness right and yeah, in my head, I was like, "Well, yeah, there's someone like me in the family." And but then, but then you still, I I emptied your mom's chair, and so you could, there can you can still be mad at, at me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So yeah. Yeah. The, and, and because again, like, 
when I was talking about, you know, Madison was fine. Or I, I was okay with, like, little little things, if you will. But then, like, the, the church. little sins. Yeah, but the church isn't true. That was too big of a thing for me to think about. That's the bridge too far. Yeah. So when that, you know, that kind of happened with um, with my with my mom and some other people I was close to, and a lot of the common theme was at some point coming across Mormon stories. And so, you know, the C, the CES letter doesn't have a, a face per se. So you're, you're the face, yeah. you know, you're yeah, the yeah. bad guy. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> My it's apologies. Fun. It's, um, it's and, it's and, 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 and I mean, and one lesson, and cause and of course we'll get into this, that I've learned just from, uh, gaining a little bit of a, a social media reach is I've quickly learned that you don't know anything about anyone just by seeing them a video or whatever. Because I'm told all sorts of things about myself that I'm <coughs> learning from strangers. I'm like, oh, that's really me. I didn't know that about myself. And so, yeah. So I there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I'm like, oh, man, maybe I shouldn't have said that about that, you know, athlete who performed poorly on my favorite sports team. Maybe I shouldn't have tweeted at him. Hopefully he didn't read it because I said it was just really kind of mean to him. He's a human, you know, or whatever. It just... Learned a lot of lessons from that, so. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be so wild having so many people weigh in on your life while going through a fit because you got big on TikTok before leaving Mormonism. That's just got to be wild when your brain is already, like, restabilizing and then having all these opinions. Yeah, and I think that's a fair question to kind of get into. Um, so you became kind of a progressive, faithful TikToker? Uh, so, well, so I... to. Timeline wise, um, in early twenty twenty one. So okay, so we get married September twenty nineteen. COVID hits, changes the world. February twenty twenty. So we stop going to church because everyone stops going to church. Um, but we're not too upset about it. We weren't super active in our newly married ward because I had worked with someone who hated me and she ended up being in our warm in our married ward so we weren't going to church a lot before covid but then covid hit and it was like okay church doesn't even happen now so yeah um and then we uh moved into my parents home um during this time as well and um i and i just want to mention this too because there's not a specific date but by this time um so I, I have two sisters grace came out to me first and that was uh, you know a big moment for myself in terms of just you know realizing stuff um and then somewhere in between this as well my uh, second sister claire also came out as queer and it, and she never you know sat me down or told me or whatever um she mentioned something on an instagram story and i just messaged her to kind of confirm what she was saying just to you know i just wanted to check in with my sister and she's like yeah um and so yeah so that happened too so now just i have two sisters they're both out to me um in this space of progressive mormonism totally fine with like that's all awesome um so yeah well fast forward just kind of a um some unimportant months in terms of our stories but early 2021 um you start doing a lot of research about stuff um, and then you end up leaving yeah okay cool so i think maybe the next part is madison for you to tell us how you went from like being a chill unorthopraxed mm -hmm. semi-believing mormon with a progressive mormon husband in an early marriage what took what took you out what took you out yeah so Take tommy's brother and sister-in-law actually like out of the blue said that they were leaving the church and that was around this this was may of 2021 yeah literally last year yeah um yeah so may of 2021 tommy's older brother and sister-in-law tell his whole family that they're leaving the church and this was like a pretty big shock but I felt like it gave me permission to 
also say that I'm done with the church. And I didn't want to completely come out and say, okay, yeah, also I'm done. Peace out. Like your whole family's like just been thrown for a loop. Also, here's another loop to be thrown through. Um, but I was pretty sure I was done. And I think it was just a bunch of little things that made me realize that I didn't believe in the church anymore. Um, one of them was my sister coming out to me. Um, and I, I just like, couldn't, I'm trying to find the right words to describe what I was feeling, but I couldn't justify being a part of a church that monetarily supported things like that were anti-LGBTQ. When I had a sister who I'm telling her that I love her, I respect her, I love that she's happy and is making these decisions that's going to make her happy and that involves her being gay, yet I'm sending money to this church that is anti-LGBTQ. Not just we don't really like gay people, whatever, it's anti yeah, like Proposition 8 where the yeah. church tries to take same-sex marriage away from, and mm -hmm. succeeds in taking same-sex marriage away from Californians. Yeah. They did the same thing in, in you know, in Arizona. They did similar things in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then just all the lobbying behind the scenes and all the amicus court briefs. Like, yeah. In fact, there's, there's probably no public advocacy that the Mormon church has been more vocal about mm -hmm. Not clean water, not hunger, not starvation, not literacy, not women's rights. It's all the gay menace. It's yeah. all kill, defeat, same-sex marriage. In like every general conference for the past 20 years. Like yeah. it's, a, it's so, I mean, I'm just like, I don't mean to like go off here. No, but yeah. Like that's what the church, mm -hmm. if the Mormon church stands for anything, it's like families and don't let gay people get married. Yeah. Like those are the, that's our brand, yeah. right? <laughs> And so I, she came out to me and I told her that I loved her and that I respected her. And I love that she was making decisions for herself that were going to make her happy. But I was paying tithing to this church who was anti my sister, anti my, whoever my sister wants to love. And I felt so much guilt about that. And I just felt like, how can I love my sister and tell her that I love her and meet her next girlfriend or whoever she decides to date? How can I meet them and look them in the eye and tell them that I respect them and respect their decision and love their decision to be together when I'm monetarily supporting an organization that hates them? And that was kind of the first well, I don't even want to say the first thing because there were just so many things like the temple that I was uncomfortable with and all so many things. But that was like the first big thing that really made me think about if I want to be supporting the church. Um, so I stopped paying tithing and I wasn't really going to church because it was during COVID. And so our board didn't even meet until I feel like they didn't meet in their church building for like a year. Um, and so that wasn't an issue. I was just not going because COVID was happening and that was like kind of my scapegoat a little bit. Um, and that was, I think that was the only thing that Tommy and I argued about was paying tithing because Tommy wanted to be temple worthy. I didn't care about that because I hated the temple pretty much since I went into it. And so I just, I didn't really care about that. And so, yeah, I stopped paying tithing. Um, and then everything just kind of <clears throat> collapsed after that. I started looking into the the stuff that you were just talking about, about Prop 8 and all that. Um, I read the CES letter. Um, and it all happened, like, pretty quickly. Really quick, what were the big things that jumped out at you from the CES letter? Ugh, all of it. <laughs> I just, um, just for people that have no idea what yeah. it is. I, so I am not super familiar. I would probably be what people call a lazy learner as in, I 
did not ever, like, I've never read the Book of Mormon all the way through. Um, I've read it like, well, at least not on my own. We've read it like as a family or something, but I'm not paying attention. I'm 14, you know, like whatever mom and dad are doing family scripture study. I'll sit here and listen, pretend that I'm paying attention. Um, but the stuff about there not being any archeological evidence of the Book of Mormon or like it taking place in North America weirded me out a little bit because I think it was the conference before, but, and this wasn't the first time that I heard, had heard it, but somebody had said something about the Book of Mormon being a book of history, like it's historically accurate. And I didn't understand how the two could be true, how there could be no evidence about it, yet it's historically accurate. Um, so that was one of them. Um Book of Abraham, did that register for you? No, I was I wasn't a super yeah, that's fine. Big reader, so Ligamy. I just Ligamy? that yeah, especially because so my mom and dad had trouble getting their temple ceiling canceled because my dad could be married to more than one or sealed to more than one woman, and he was getting remarried to my stepmom, but my mom wasn't getting remarried, so they were like, well, if you cancel your ceiling, then you're not going to have these covenants. You're not going to be able to go to the highest degree. And that really bothered me is that my dad could just go and get sealed to another person, but my mom couldn't. And I was like, okay, well. Yeah, they literally, number one, will let a Mormon man who mm -hmm. gets divorced get sealed to as many women as he marries Yeah. without end. So literally mm -hmm. a Mormon man could die being sealed to five women in the afterlife if – if all of the five women that he marries and then divorces mm -hmm. weren't sealed to somebody else. So that's like polygamy existing yeah. in modern Mormonism. But then that other thing where your mom may be like, I don't want to be sealed to this guy forever. Yeah. Sometimes even, even a woman won't believe the church is true anymore. will think that the sealing thing is all dumb, but they'll still say, I don't want to be sealed to this guy, even in this magic fictitious yeah. La La Land Mormon marriage stuff but they won't let a woman uh, spiritually or un divorce or unseal herself mm -hmm. from her husband unless she's got another Mormon yeah. man. Unless she has a replacement. Wanting to marry her in the yeah. temple. And that's mind boggling in mm -hmm. 2022. Right? So they, they will just flat out refuse. There's no like process for. I think I mean, they'll, they'll him and ha and yeah. give her a hard time. But, but some of the women, this is in Carolyn Pearson's book, the ghost of eternal polygamy mm -hmm. that women have to like beg and cajole and even talk to a man and beg him to yeah. let her get unsealed. Even if it's allowed for so many women, the process of having to beg and plead to get unsealed. Yeah. Traumatizing. And there's it, not like a set process that you go through to like have a get unsealed unless you have another worthy marriage, then it's, extremely difficult to cancel your ceiling to your first husband or second, whatever. Um, so yeah, that was another thing. And it was just all these little tiny things that like I had doubts about them before, but now reading them in somebody else's words and them providing, I, I don't know if I want to call it evidence, but to me it was evidence at the time. And I believed pretty much everything that the CAS letter said. And so you didn't mention Joseph Smith's polygamy bugging you. No, I, I honestly didn't know about it. I didn't, I didn't learn about it at church. Like I knew that he practiced polygamy, but I didn't know to the extent. And I didn't know that it was with underage girls. And but you learned that in the CES letter. Yeah. And then what was your reaction? Um, I was disgusted. I think that, I, I think the biggest thing that bothered me was the fact that I didn't learn that at church, that it was buried and that I, nobody talked about it when it's a huge problem and like why are we not addressing that like it's being hidden from me and I have to read it in this anti-Mormon literature and it's not even like it's just facts like it's not it's not really anti-Mormon to tell the history of the Mormon church but the Mormon church doesn't want it puts a bad look on the church so so this is weird and it's not weird but I'm just gonna play the the role of mm -hmm. the church here. This is weird because in 2020 and 2014, 
the church came out with like 10 or 15 gospel topics essays. Mm -hmm. One of them was polygamy and yeah. Joseph Smith's polygamy. And so you should have learned about that in 2014. Why yeah. didn't you learn about it from the gospel topics essay on polygamy that the church put out? I didn't know those things existed. Oh, <laughs> right. I, yeah, I was taught growing up that what you learn is from the Book of Mormon, the Bible, sometime, sometimes the Bible. They've got little footnotes that <laughs> Joseph Smith has made some corrections and whatnot. And what your church leaders say. And even then, sometimes, or not church leaders, the prophet, the prophet and the apostles. Um, anything else that you hear is, might be true, might not be, whatever. And that's so, so it's so mind, it's almost like Orwellian that the church publishes these essays in 2014, but they don't want the youth to read them. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking seven, eight years after they've been published. Yeah. You've, you're a Mormon, the church published these essays and you've never heard about them. Yeah. And then you're feeling betrayed. Yeah. And I think that if I would have learned about them in 2014, I mean, I was a junior in high school. I probably would not, I might've had like, oh, and ew, that's gross. Why would he marry underage women? But I, th I don't think I would have, it wouldn't have triggered me to leave the church. But now reading it after, like it's basically been hidden from me. I had never heard about the gospel topic essays until Tommy told me about them. And yeah, I was just, I was very angry that I was not presented with all of the information after I had been extremely faithful to this church for 21, 22 years. So. And it's a weird dynamic because the church doesn't want and hasn't promoted the gospel topics essays broadly. Like there's never been a general conference where the church has told all the members to read the gospel topics essays. I don't mm -hmm. think they've ever been mentioned yet in general conference, mm -hmm. it, but, but as of 2022, <clears throat> They want them to be out there so that if someone's in crisis, they can be pointed to them, mm -hmm. but they don't want to trigger people's faith crisis by promoting them. And so they want, so they want yeah. them there, but they don't want them there. And the cost of that is, is people feeling betrayed. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? I did feel betrayed and lied to. Um, and at first I was kind of angry at my parents for not, informing me of these things but then I asked my dad if he even knew about the gospel topic essays and he had no idea and so it wasn't just that oh I was 16 and I was kind of just naive it my 40 year old dad didn't even know about them and he he's very he's very Mormon he's very devout he is the elders quorum president right now he's always held like young men's callings like leadership positions whatever and he had no idea what these were. And yeah, so I I read the CES letter and I think I had already made up my mind about if I was going to leave the church before I read the CES letter, but the CES letter was just the nail in the coffin. I was completely done after that. And I had written down all of these things. I wish that I still had the note in my phone, but I don't think I do, um, that I wanted to talk to Tommy about. Because I was like, I knew that he had read the CES letter. I was like, okay, so you've read, you have all the information that I have now. We are on level playing grounds. Is that is that the phrase? <laughs> okay. Um, and I, yeah, so that's when I came to him and just said, hey, this is what, I'm now learning none of this is new information to Tommy. He had read the CES letter and I was like, I cannot do this anymore. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, yeah. So number one, Tommy, you didn't tell us you read the CES letter. And then number two, I'm dying to know how you read it and didn't <clears throat> lose your faith. And then I want to hear totally how, how it was for you to respond to Madison, losing your faith after reading something that didn't cause you to lose your faith. But let's start with, take us back to when you first read the CES letter, if you remember. Yeah. Um, I, I don't remember the time uh, period or time frame. I do remember um, uh, reading it, and um, 
there was there was a mixture of stuff that I, I had heard before and stuff that I hadn't heard before. Um, the first thing I did after reading it was search for faith affirming responses. Um, um, and I found Jim Bennett. some, mm-hmm. um, and there were, I, I had, uh, like just a classic apologist answer to anything that I had, uh, troubles with, or I openly had troubles with stuff, but just kind of, um, I, the, the main thing again for me was, you know, for whatever reason, I just, re- I, I definitely really wanted to stay. So that bias was just there. So, um, so like learning about the ages of some of Joseph Smith's wives at one point, you know, co- you know, years ago, I would have just said, well, that was just, you know, the time period when people got married. It's just that thing. At this point, after I, when I had read the CES letter, I had thrown that idea away and just thought it's weird and it's creepy. Um, but I still want prophets to st- are imperfect. Yeah, or or I don't even know. To there, there is no logical line to where I ended up. Wherever, you know how much time it, it took was, I I just don't want to really leave because what does that mean? What is life without Mormonism? I don't know. And so I just didn't allow myself to get to a point where, um, I would end up leaving. So I didn't have a perfect answer of like, well, it's totally fine because this or this or like we just don't know. I was like, no, that's gross. I don't, I hate it, but I still want to stay. What about same with Book of Mormon and you know, historicity? Um, yeah, yeah. And I so my testimony. So when 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 Madison came to me with these things, my personal testimony about truthfulness of stuff was a skeleton, and it was down to I really do believe that there's a God and that he has a son, Jesus Christ. He came down, uh, died for our sins. And again, going back to my mission experiences, that the priesthood had been restored and I, I had somehow played a role in using the priesthood and that those experiences were real. But honestly, everything else was a big old question mark or just uh, I don't believe that. So it was really small. Yeah, and so it's like, not sure if this is the true church, not sure how much Joseph Smith was a prophet versus a fallen prophet, not sure how true the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine and Covenants or the Book of Abraham are, but I don't want any empty chairs. I love my family. I don't want to disappoint everybody. And, you know, I, I, I want to do this because I don't know how else I'm going to be happy in my life. Exactly, and it's, a, it's that last one that was the biggest motivator was like, what else would I do? I really don't know. I I literally don't know any other way to live. And, you know, being in Utah or whatever, too, is just like, okay, that's just not the norm. Um, What am I going to do? I'll just stay. Because I created a space where I felt I could just sit and totally just survive there. And I don't want to make this too dark or technical, but, like, I think there's a there's a concept that I think a psychologist named Marty Seligman popularized called learned helplessness. That if you like get a dog in a little circle and you know it elect- it shocks him every time he tries to leave a circle, at some point you can remove the shock fence or the shock collar and he's just gonna stay in the circle because mm-hmm. his whole life he's been trained you can't leave the circle learned helplessness. Yeah. And I don't mean, and I don't think the church would ever do that intentionally. But what I'm hearing you say is that from all your indoctrination or teachings or family experiences, as wonderful as your family was, you got to adulthood feeling like you can't be healthy and happy and be a Mormon. And that's what made me stay in the church 13 years after I stopped believing in it. I stayed active <clears throat> until they kicked me out because I'm like, I can't. I won't be a faithful husband if I leave the church. And I, my kids, I can't raise a help. You can't raise happy, healthy kids without being a Mormon. You know, plus I'll disappoint everybody. I'm staying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you say the church wouldn't do that on purpose, but it's a pretty open message of them that like, if you leave, you will suffer. You will be unable to cope. The outside world is scary. Like those are all messages they've openly taught. 
Right. And the only point I'm, I don't think like Jeffrey Holland's going, mm, how do I lie to keep them in the church? I but bet, he did I bet, say he would like, what was the thing he said about missions that he would tie a missionary up to make sure they right. don't go home. But I think that's because he sincerely believes and yeah. maybe it's been his experience that when people leave their missions early, their life doesn't go so well. Now, maybe that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because they get treated so poorly when they come home. But I think Jeffrey Holland probably sincerely feels like it's not going to be in the missionary's best interest to leave his mission early. And likewise, I think when when general authorities make these ominous warnings about, you know, mm -hmm. you'll never be happy, don't leave the boat, you know, it's only misery to be an ex-Mormon, I think they really believe it. Yeah. And I think they really think it. Yeah. Well, if you That's all I'm saying. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. So that it's sincere when they teach that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, potentially. But when you encourage psychological dependency and then you remove the thing that people are psychologically dependent on, what you know what they're going to do of course, their life probably does come crumbling down in a lot of instances like right. it d there's not an automatic replacement people have to figure that out and it's usually yeah. like such a wrestle battle yeah. and that's why mormon stories exist that's why Zelf on the shelf exists <laughs> just we're all realizing this is way too hard and not super healthy or ethical if you if it ends up if it, if it's working for you if there's no empty chairs and your all your family stays in and nobody's gay and nobody's you know reads the ces letter and nobody's super depressed or whatever. No one gets divorced. Yeah. It's great. But that's no Mormon story anywhere. Oh, no because, human life. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because people are going to stumble on the CES letter. Or they're going to look at porn. Or they're going to have premarital sex. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to lose their faith. Or they're going to be gay or bisexual or transgender or um, something. And so, like, it, it and so it, it's just so, I almost, I think about, both, I think about your family particularly, Tommy, this whole, like, no empty chairs thing, how it sets parents up for such disappointment. Yeah. Because you, like, you, you, all the kids are young. They can't leave the church. You're a bishop. You're serving in the church. You're doing your family home evening. You're singing the songs, and everybody's happy, and it feels wonderful. It's like Ned Flanders and the Flanders, Flanders <laughs> family on The Simpsons. And you think... You think, oh, I can get 15 years into this, and you're still feeling like the dream is alive, and we're on our way. But then, like, to no fault of your mom's, no fault of your dad's, the kids start dropping like flies. And then all of a sudden, it's more empty chairs than not empty chairs. Mm -hmm. And like your mom, I'm thinking about your mom when she lost her faith. She's got to be like, okay, wait a minute. Now there's now there's an empty chair. Oh, now there's another empty chair. Well, that's sad heaven all of a sudden. I don't want to go to the celestial kingdom without my two daughters. Oh, and now my daughter-in-law? And then, you know, and then all of a sudden, and it's like that's when that's when the Mormon dream unravels. Yeah. And I feel bad for parents that are kind of set up to be to to fail a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's your mom's story, but like Yeah, it could be. Who wants um, to go to sad heaven? Who wants to go to sad Mormon heaven where half your family isn't there? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I'd say nobody, hopefully. You know? Yeah. I hope that's nobody's dream. I mean, yeah. if you don't think, if you want to go there, then you probably don't think it's sad. But fair. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So when she, so you found a way to just turn it off. Like you literally, this is Book of Mormon musical stuff. You're yeah. not gay in, in this story, but you're, you're basically saying, okay, Everything's problematic, but I don't want to leave and I can't leave. But now my wife is coming to me saying she doesn't believe anymore. So, like, how did you handle it? Yeah, so like, like she mentioned, um, right before she left and, and talked to me about stuff, my older brother, my singular older brother, again, the same brother that we crossed over on our missions uh, together, um, he left, and him and his wife left. Um, and it was a big surprise because, like, a month prior – him and I went out to Chili's. Shout out, uh, shout out to Chili's. Um, and and I, I specifically wanted to go out to dinner with them to ask because I knew that his uh, his wife had some questions and Madison had some questions. So I wanted to have like this little brother to brother conversation about like, so how are how are you managing this? Like, what's you know just kind of like that. And we we. Both, honestly, we came uh, uh, out with some answers, like, okay, like, we can just kind of, I guess, talk about, like, um, you know, we can, we can bring up, like, spiritual experiences that we've shared together and, and things like that. And so I left, and like, okay, like, that seems like a, you know, a good answer. 
And just weeks later, we got like a, a text message that him and his wife were leaving. So I was like, wait, what? The opposite thing happened. <laughs> what is going on? Um, and so uh, that that was a big blow because, again, if we're counting all the siblings, there's five of us. And so now three have left. It's me and my littlest brother, uh, technically in the church at this point. Yeah, so like more child empty chairs than full chairs. Yeah, so if there's the seven chairs, uh, (laughs) three and a half are (laughs) empty. Uh, And so, yeah, chairs are are pretty uh, empty at this point. And so, um, you know, Madison comes to me, and and I remember we are, I think our most... Um, argument like the arguments that led to the most just you know confusion or just no resolution were the ones where she would come to me and be like okay I learned this 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 and this it's upsetting to me um, and I'm leaving because of this and I would and she was like she would say do you know about this and I would say yeah and she's like okay but then why are you still in it <laughs> yeah. and we, we were reading the same material but coming to different conclusions and that was so confusing to me. And I and, I, and I yeah. think beyond, because we honestly, we came to similar conclusions, which were like, this is bad. Yeah. I don't like this or whatever. But the next step, what to do about it, hers was like, okay, it's bad, so I'm going to leave. And I was like, yes, it's bad, <laughs> but I'm staying. <laughs> and, and so, and I understood her point of view. I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome in some respects. Uh, but I'm going to choose to stay. And again, the whole, uh, the big motivator was what else would I do? Uh, which is, uh, you know, Elder Ballard's question and that old ship Zion, go? right? Where, you, where would and you go? Those were my questions. I was like, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> but I don't, and my main thing was like, I, I just don't want to die and be like wrong. Yeah. Right. And so stakes I was. Are, stakes are high. Yeah, they're huge stakes. So I'm like, okay. And I always told myself, I said, I will never leave. If I ever am not Mormon anymore, it's because I've been excommunicated. It'll be always, it'll be someone else's decision. Um, I relate to that. (laughs) Yeah. And so I was like, that's what's going to happen. That'll be, uh, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm writing that future if that's what happens. Um, so Madison, uh, tells me like she's done, done with the church and for like, a day, maybe less. We're like, okay, what does this mean for us as a couple? Are we going to remain married? Is this the end of our marriage? What does this look like? What does this look like? How far into your marriage are you at this point? Um, coming up on two years. Yeah. Um, and by the end of that conversation, it's we'll make it work. Yeah, we, I think that the only reason that we were able to have such a quick conversation and it wasn't like us debating, like, how are we going to get our relationship to work with me being an ex-Mormon and him being a Mormon was because when we were dating, we were, we made it, I'm trying to figure out, I'm like stumbling over my words. Um, We made sure that we had common values and it wasn't just, Oh, we're both Mormon because I think at that point in our relationship or just in our lives, we realized like being Mormon does not mean the same thing for everyone. Um, I was, I mean, Tommy was more nuanced and I was introduced to the, just the word nuanced and, um, So we made it, we made sure that we were going to have the same values, whether we were in the church or out of the church. At the time, it wasn't, we were thinking, oh, well, what if one of us leaves? It was just, this is important to us, whether we're Mormon or not. So yeah. And it was things like, do you think gay marriage is bad? And neither of us thought it was bad or do you believe in God? Like super, super baseline values that we thought that we needed to agree on in order to have a successful marriage. 
Yeah, and so yeah, uh, our <clears throat> you know our our marriage wasn't based like you said. It wasn't just oh we're both you know us both being Mormon. Although like it definitely presented as like a you know it was a big deal. Um, it wasn't like the founding building block of our relationship. It's like yeah. pulling that didn't knock everything else down. There was other stuff where we had a, had a strong foundation. Um, and I also think, like, for me personally, just um, seeing my parents' marriage work. Um, and at that point, just being a progressive uh, Mormon, I found myself in spaces where there were other mixed-faith marriages that worked. And also, this is just so funny and random, but it definitely made me think, like, this could work. Um, Jimmer Fredette, the basketball player, I just was very aware that um, his dad was Mormon and his mom wasn't. And I was like, and he's doing pretty fine, and his parents are, I mean, I don't know him personally, but... Last time I saw a documentary about them, they were sitting next to each other, so that seemed positive. <laughs> so I was like, they can do it. And so, yeah, I just definitely had such a strong belief um, that mixed faith marriage could work, um, that our our conversation, like, what does this mean for us, was quite short. Yeah. And ended it in a positive way, so. Okay. And yeah, if Jimmer can do it, anyone can do it, right? <laughs> right? That's, totally. That's what I always What's say. What's that guy up to? I haven't had that name in years. He does. T- he has a TikTok channel where he like teaches people how to play basketball. But he was a star mm-hmm. in China. He didn't make it in the NBA, but he became a star in China trying to professional Whoa, basketball. Cool. I don't know if he's playing right now, but yeah, I'm not sure. <coughs> but so you guys decided to go the mixed mixed faith marriage route. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So how'd that go? Talk us through that. Yeah. So um, again, just context and circumstances. Um, Church was all through, or there uh, there are at least Zoom options for church. Zoom, the you know the software, and so, um, you know, being a, a believing member did not require me to have to go and you know to a church building. I could be in bed or on the couch or wherever, and you know listen to talks. Um, we also had just. We were about to move, and, and, and as a mixed faith couple, we moved out of my parents to our own condo, into a new ward, and so there weren't any like, oh, where's Madison at? Is she, you know, they, we hadn't gone yet because we were just tuning in through a link from an email, um, and so the that part was very practical and, and made a lot of sense and was quite simple actually, um, but I. I, again, I think our biggest conflict was wasn't a differing of beliefs because we had the irony was that we actually had near the same beliefs. It was again just this decision for me to stay and her decision to leave were com- you know those are completely opposite decisions. Um, and so we we mutually decided early on in our mixed faith marriage that neither of us uh, would try to convince the other person to do the other thing that I wouldn't try to bring her back and she wouldn't try to get me to leave. And I think that was really important from the get-go. We made that promise to each other. And then, honestly, we, we avoided a lot of conversations um, because they always ended up with, well, then how do you stay? And I'm like, I don't know. And then it just, because I want to, and I, you know, I figured this out and, you know, and, and, and that, that wasn't a good enough answer for me. And so it always turned into a fight. And it was like, I think I remember we talked about cognitive dissonance one night. And it just ended up in a huge argument. And so we were just very careful about what, not in like a sense like, oh, we can't talk about these topics. But just needing to learn how to be sensitive about the other person's feelings about the topic. And, yeah, so there were a few things that we just did not talk about at all as a couple um, for a long time. But some, of the, some of the most common ones are like, well, you've already mentioned one. You know, one of you is like, how can you stay when the church does so much harm? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's one tricky one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, tithing was one because mm-hmm. I continued to pay tithing. How can you pay money to a church that does so much harm? Yeah. Right, and you would say? Um, I'm trying to remember. 
uh, I, I think I just, I don't even know. I think it was just, know. he wanted to be temple worthy. That's what he was taught his entire life. Yeah. And that was his answer for me. And I, it did not make sense at the time. And be, mostly because we weren't attending the temple. Tommy wasn't attending the temple. So I was like, I just wanted to shake him and be like, why do you want a temple recommend so bad? And I had to come, I had to be really mature about it and just come to the conclusion that he will come up with an answer in his own time. And me pressuring him to come up with an answer is not going to help. It's going to make things worse. It's going to make our relationship tense. And so, yeah, we just... There's some tense moments, but yeah. Another common one is what do we know with the kids? Like <clears throat> if we have kids, are we going to raise them in the church? And the non-believer would be like, no way in H I'm yeah. raising my kids in this church. Did you guys talk about that one? Um, we did. And the answer was, we'll worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we we're not well. even have. close to ha like trying to have kids right now. So yeah. we're like, whatever. Yeah. Keep that one on the back burner. We don't need yeah. to start a fight about that. Yeah. <laughs> and I definitely felt in that, because we were about we were a mixed faith marriage for for a little bit, and I and I felt very privileged in that space to not have kids. Because we, you know, we would um, whether it was marriage on a tightrope, the Facebook group. Did you did you join that? Yeah. So yeah, yeah we joined the group. Um, we actually did a podcast uh, as oh, guests you did? with Alan. Yeah. And Katie oh, we'll include Matt. that. Okay. Um, I know they've been on uh, this show. Um, they're awesome. Oh yeah, he's my other workout partner. I've seen. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm Facebook friends with Alan. I've seen oh, some yeah. photos. You guys are killing it. <laughs> maybe i need to join i need some help um but um yeah so we uh you know just reached out for resources again I, I i felt like i could go to my parents and talk to them um but yeah just being kidless we didn't have that mm -hmm. conversation about what will we do with the kids that was uh we'll worry about it when we get there yeah. was marriage on a tightrope a help so the marriage on a tightrope is a podcast it was started by my friends, Alan and Katie Mount. Alan's still, uh, Katie's still in the church and is a believer. He's a progressive believer. And then, and then Alan is no longer in the church. Alan TikToks, he has an amazing TikTok channel. Uh, Mount of a Man, I think was one of his handles. I don't know what it is right now. But basically, they started a podcast to help support people in mixed faith marriages. They do, they do workshops. They, they've done events. And they've got this amazing uh, Facebook group. Yeah. So how was it helpful for you guys? And if so, how? Um, it was both. It was it was it was both helpful and not helpful in 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 my particular um, experience. Um, because <clears throat> excuse me, um, sometimes I would read experiences and stories that made the mixed faith marriage seem awesome. And totally doable. And then other times I would read experiences that made a mixed faith marriage seem like it was impossible. And those really scared me. And I ended up leaving the group for a small amount of time because I would, I constantly, it, it, it must have just been that day, but there seemed to be a barrage of, um, you know, we, you know, I, my, my, you know, whichever my partner has has been fine with this mixed faith marriage thing um, for years, but today they came up to me and they said, "I can't do this anymore. I need to, to this needs to end. Uh, let's get a divorce, or like we're getting a divorce or something." And I was just like, "Oh no, is this just how it all? Is this the only option, really? Like, is this, um, you know, what it goes down to? Because all all of a sudden, all these helpful." you know, successful faith, uh, mixed faith marriages to me, I was like, well, maybe they just haven't reached the point to when they inevitably get divorced. Maybe this is just happy time still. And divorce is just the only way. It's looming in the distance. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I felt like, and again, I think this was just like a, a day or a moment where I just felt like I was getting a ton of these. So I, I left the group for a bit because I was like, I don't want that to become my expectation. It was like, 5, 10, 20, 40 years down the road, it's just like, all right, or it's, we're over. Um, How about for you, Madison? I never joined the group. Okay. Um, mostly because Tommy would come to me and say, I saw this in the group, and now I'm worried about our marriage. And so I was like, well, if he's reading all these things in this group, I don't want, I don't want to be reading those things and getting those thoughts in my head. But, um, yeah, I just, because... 
I feel like what's different about our, or was different about our mixed faith marriage was that we did have a lot of the same beliefs. We just weren't coming to the same conclusion. Whereas the stories that I was reading about other people, they had completely differing beliefs. And so it just, it wasn't super helpful for me, but, um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I guess I'm just kind of curious cause you got married while both technically believing Mormons, right? Mm -hmm. Did it ever, did you ever wrestle with the fact that like, oh, we chose to get married because we're Mormon and especially for you once you weren't, was it then just weird to reflect back on that or by that point were you just so established that it didn't um, come to mind? I had that thought for a minute, but it wasn't, that wasn't a super, yeah, that wasn't a huge thought that I had mostly because we weren't super active most of our relationship because of COVID. And so it was like, okay, well, we haven't been going to church this entire time. We haven't been attending the temple. And I don't know, Mormonism wasn't like a huge bonding experience for us. Like it wasn't like, oh, we both, we met on our missions and like. Like Katie and Alan. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> like this huge core of our relationship, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And so having that breakdown, it did just because I think I had heard of so many people getting divorced because one of them's not Mormon and whatever, and they got married because they were both Mormon and that was just the expectation. Um, we didn't have that. And so, yeah, I had the thought for a second, but it didn't really make sense for me to have that thought because that wasn't a bonding point in, when we were dating, I think. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah, and I I had the same thought too, and I purposely went there just to check it, to be like, okay, did we just get married just because we were both Mormon and that was like kind of, you know, we get married that quickly because of that and I just wanted to kind of dissect it just to give it its, I thought it was a, a healthy place to go to, honestly, because I didn't want to, you know, just avoid it or whatever. And I came to the same quick conclusion of like, of no, you know, that wasn't the basis of our marriage. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, w went there just to kind of see it, ask that question, um, came to the same conclusion. I mean, Samantha, you ask a really important question just because for many who leave the church af after getting married, it's like I could have had fun in high school and college. I could have experimented in all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. I could have... I may not have married this person, but I was taught that whoever, you know, you marry anyone who's righteous and faithful, the marriage is going to work. But turns out marriage is harder than I thought and yeah. we're less compatible than I thought. And as long as we've got the gospel in common, then we can make it work. But if yeah. we don't have the gospel in common anymore, I don't know that I want to make it work. And, yeah. and there are a lot of marriages that don't survive a faith crisis. And then the church can point to those and say, see, self-fulfilling prophecy. They leave the church, the marriage fails. Yeah. And that's not fair, right? Yeah. I definitely okay. had not regrets about our marriage, but like, oh, I wish that I could have experienced other things. Not because we were married, but because I was a member of the church when I was yeah. younger. And so I didn't get to experience the typical American, you know. Um, yeah, or like college life, you know, like I had a very conservative college life. I mean, I lived on a dry campus, like. You don't, know, you know, there's, they have chocolate milk parties, you know, like <laughs> that's, that's my college experience. And so once I left the Mormon church, I was like, oh, I wish that I could have had more experiences, but it was never, I wish that I could have not married Tommy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 Yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, so around this, uh, this time, um, I started making TikTok videos and before I made my first like LDS centric one, I, we were, I remember a specific moment. We were still living at my parents' house. We're in the basement and I just happened to be in the basement bathroom. And I thought to myself, um, you know, ever since like COVID happened, TikTok has blown up and it's just, you know, everyone has it. I don't see anyone out there making like really specific LDS humor or satire stuff. I think I could 
jump into that and maybe have some success. Did you always like comedy? Because I didn't even ask what your hobbies were in high school. But um, Yeah, so I've always l- liked laughing and making other people laugh. I don't know if like if I were just to be like, yeah, I watched a bunch of stand-up and all this kind of stuff growing up. That's not particularly true. Um, but I always um, like m- m- making people laugh in school or whatever group I'm in. Um, yeah. Okay. And so I thought like I could maybe be that person in that space. I was like, this space is so much here. Like everyone, I know just growing up in the church that people love a faithful funny person or funny group like Studio C or something like that person. Uh, th- those people exist, but I just don't see one on TikTok right now. I think I could be that person. And this was a conscious thought that I had. I think I could be that person, but just knowing where I am with my own personal faith, this could maybe go a different route sometime down the, <laughs> the line. Cause I'm not here being like, yeah, and it's all true. And I believe that everything and let's make jokes. I'm like, very close I'm very progressive nuanced um making jokes and so I you know the f- the first I made some couple like I made a couple like going on dates with RMs from that went to this country this country this country video videos but the first TikTok video that I made that really caught attention um was or ones titled um what Mormons think judgment day will be and I and I poked direct fun and through satire kind of criticized um, a lot of LDS beliefs when it comes to Judgment Day. So uh, just to kind of run through it, I made jokes about like, you know, tattoos are bad, but microblading your eyebrows is totally okay. And that coffee is off the table, uh, but there's a, there's a soda shop in heaven. Um, or don't work on Sundays, that's against the rules, unless you're a star football player promoting a religion, and that, that's totally fine. <laughs> or just these little things that I that I was coming to in a comedic sense, being like, this is silly, but it was jokey enough to be like, oh, let's just laugh about it, um, not really f- face the, d- you know, the deeper whatever, let's just laugh and have a good time with it. Um, My Orthodox Mormon brain conceptualizes that as being anti-Mormon, right? Yeah, yeah, he definitely got a lot of comments about people being like, are, are you ex-Mormon? And he was like, no, I'm, I'm an active <laughs> Mormon. And yeah, there are a lot of... Because you're, you're highlighting hypocrisies in mm-hmm. the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, but the, the irony too was I got, I think, equally the amount of people saying, I'm ex-Mormon, but I think this is really funny. And I'm... Currently a Mormon, but I think this is really funny. Assu- this, yeah. Assuming that I was the other one. Yeah. And for a while, I didn't tell people. Because one, I just felt like it's none of their business. But two, I was just fascinated by, like, I'm getting both, like, criticized and applauded by both groups of people. But it, this is <laughs> hilarious. Because because I can definitely see from both sides of, like, oh, seeing this, be like, yeah, this person knows my culture, my jokes. This is one of us. That's funny. And someone else being like, well, yeah, duh, that's so silly. Who would ever believe that? And both people being like, oh, that, this is funny. This is great. And it was just such a, a, a funny space to be in for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did it start taking off? Did you start growing exponentially in your subscribers at TikTok? Yeah. So, yeah. So that that um, that first Judgment Day one, um, I saw the success of it. So the very next day I made a second one. And the next day I made a third one. Because I was when like. you say success, like how many views? Um, it right now sits at like 900,000, 800,000 oh, views. Yeah, like TikTok, you can reach a million people with one 10 or 20 second video. It's unbelievable. It's like worst thing ever for the church, right? <laughs> it, it does move fast and it knows where you are and it knows what you're thinking, I swear. Um, but yeah, it does move quickly. And it's funny too, because again, um, you know, it's getting reshared by people. Um, and particularly like on Instagram, you can share it to your story and then add your own little comment to it. And people, again, it was like half and half of being like, look how silly Mormonism is. It's just like this. And other people being like, uh, like our culture is so funny, like, yeah. you know, um, and I'm at a place where honestly, I felt kind of not objective, but like on both, I was like, this is both silly and 
funny, but dumb and whatever. Like, I just, I honestly felt like more of like a messenger of like, hey, here's what's taught. Like it or not, you know, do with it what you will. Um, and I, so just for, for timeline's sake, May 2021, my brother and his wife decide to leave. May slash June, Madison decides to leave. July, I start making videos. So there's definitely a motivator from all of this stuff c coming into my life where people that I love are leaving. Um, what does that mean for me? What am I doing with my life? I don't know. I'm trying to figure things out, and an outlet for me are these videos. That's truly what the motivator was. Again, like I mentioned, I did think that there was an open space and maybe someone could capitalize on it, and I thought maybe I'll do that. But it, it definitely was also just all this commotion going up here just onto a screen and kind of being comedic about it. Okay. Okay. So that's just a year ago. So what happened between then and now? How did things advance for both of you? I think this is your... My side of the story? Yeah. Okay. Um, how, how, how Tommy lost his faith? Mm -hmm. went, went from progressive Mormon TikToker to no longer believing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I, I just want to start off, too, because I would I would get comments in my videos um, from, again, both active and former members um, that I, I found just, like, kind of unnecessary. Um, and, I, and, and I think we're all still trying to learn, like, online behavior, you know? Manners. Etiquette. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes... And again, at this point, I, I was pretty confident, at least on the surface level, that, you know, I, I know all the bad stuff, but I'm still here. And so people would be like, well, or they would just write, like, read the CES letter, send comment. <laughs> and I would respond, I'd be like, I have. Um, kind of all snarky. Or they would be like, just leave. You are You can see that it's weird, just leave. And I would say... No thanks, with like a little heart emoji <laughs> again, all snarky. Or on the other end, be like, "This is you know." Or I just I didn't I didn't like all the comments telling me what to do. Honestly, I was like, L "I'm just trying to put this out here." Um, and I I have to admit, like from the get go, and even you know sometimes today I'm I can be pretty quick with like the block button, just like slap yeah, it and boom, boom, boom. Me too. And so even prior to me making uh, these videos, just while I was just trying to figure stuff out on my own, I was seeing a lot of your stuff, and I hit block real quick. Um, you, and blocked, you blocked me, Tommy. I did, I did, <laughs> I blocked. But I don't think I would come on and say mean things. Yeah, and you didn't. It was a preemptive block. <laughs> I just didn't want to see your content on my on my for you page because I was like again this, oh okay the, it wasn't yeah. me sliding into your comments no, no 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 it no. was my video showing up in your for you page yes and 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 this is going back <laughs> so you blocked me <laughs> yeah and this this is going back in time just a little bit where I was listening to the four fifths of the Mormon stories yeah so on one and one on one app I'm searching for <laughs> your content and on the other <laughs> app so I don't want to see it on not on my uh like with it just popping up, I want to be in control of when I see you. So I just boop, boop, <laughs> block, block. That's awesome. So I remember at one point I'm like, someone's going, Oh, check out this video. It's so funny. And I'm like, where is it? I can't, yeah, like, where's, I can't yeah. find it. It's not, I'm like, that dude blocked me. I, I did. I did. And again, this was, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. And this was before I even made a, a single you know, video about all this stuff. Um, <laughs> I just doing my own, trying to uh, curate my own, I literally Content. was like, what did I do? I I, what, <laughs> like, did I say something? Like, I did. Yeah. No, John, did yeah. you know Kara blocked herself on Twitter before no, we had ever? It seems awesome. to just be a thing you do yeah. when you're like, I don't want to see it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Even if you've funny. never engaged. It's funny. Yeah. But I was wondering what I did. Anyway. Yeah, well, absolutely nothing <laughs> is what you did. So, um, um, so yeah, so I, you know, making, making these videos, um, I a lot of it again. If you go back and you rewatch a lot of them, I think you can see a someone just struggling with their faith and trying to make sense of it. Because I am all all the jokes are satire type stuff. Um, 
And depending on what lens you're wearing, it's like that's super faithful and funny or that's super not faithful and rude or whatever it might be. Kind of like what you were that you mentioned, like people get upset about, you know, satire or whatever you're talking about. Um, but um, so I'm making this content, but on the inside, I'm I'm struggling to to keep my faith. Um, and, um, the, the, the big moment for me, um, because I, I was so tied to, and, and, um, hearing you talk about it made me, I think, realize something about why being tumble worthy was so important to me was because my, uh, experience was just at age 10 when I viewed porn for the first time that was the first time I had to start getting back to being temple worthy. And every like little thing I ever did in my life from, from every thought to every action was either making me closer to being temple worthy or not. Like everything I did was so focused because for me, temple worthy equaled celestial kingdom worthy, which equaled no empty chairs, which equaled family forever. Like end goal, like every little thing I did played some role in, getting me further away or closer to happy heaven or whatever, families forever. And so I just, I, I didn't know any other way to operate. So on one part, I'm seeing all this stuff that the church is doing and that the church teaches that I just either don't like or just ultimately disagree with. Um, but the need to be temple worthy just in case was so strong. But that finally fell and collapsed just this past July, so just a couple months ago, um, watching Mormon No More on YouTube, or on Hulu, rather, sorry, on Hulu. And this is, a, for those who haven't seen it, yeah. it's a documentary. Well, we had Sal and Lena on Mormon Stories. Mm -hmm. It's basically two Mormon women who marry men, have lots of kids, then in L.A. they fall in love, uh, divorce end up getting divorced from their husbands and have now married each other. And they did a Hulu documentary about them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's, that's the documentary you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it follows their, um, you know, it tells their story like you, you know, you just explained and, and ultimately shows them getting married. And, and I, you know, and I think timing is just a big thing. Um, and just being prepared for different life events. And for me, for whatever reason, watching that show and seeing them f fall in love and and get married was a, the final straw or whatever you want to say for me to be like, you know, I just, I you know, I've pulled my support in so many ways of the church. I, I want to pull all of it. And I had never even thought that in my life. You know, while I'm watching the documentary, for the first time in my life, I had the thought uh, in my head, I think I'm done with the church. And and I just start spiraling um, silently. Like, Madison and I are sitting on the couch, we're watching it, and I'm just like, oh, man. Uh, I've never thought that before. And just, again, just the thought of it sent, I was anxious, I was scared, and I was really scared to tell Madison, which, you know, however long we're into this episode sounds probably silly because she's already left. She's been gone for a year, but I was still just scared, I think, to say it out loud. So I slept on it. I told myself, I'll sleep on it. Maybe it's, maybe it's just too late at night. And I woke up uh, still pretty uh, committed to leaving. I remember we were sitting down at, uh, on the couch, still scared. I put a, a pillow in between us. I said, this has nothing to do with you. This is all me, and I, and I know I'm being weird, but I want to tell you something. And I put a pillow in between us. Like I held it up. And I was like, I think I'm done with the church. And she was like, okay. Um, and, this, and this next thing that she said, to me, proves to why Madison's the best. Because she said, she said, uh, okay, um, you come to that conclusion. If you ever decide that you want to go back, that's up to you. You don't have to stay like out wherever you're at because we've had these conversations where I'm like, do I want to, I don't know. I don't know. So she understood that like this could, you know, maybe tomorrow I'll be like, actually, no, 
but she made it very clear. She said, um, you know, whatever you do, I just want you to be happy and, and make that decision. And I, if, knowing myself, that would have been the d- best time just to dunk on me and be like, told you so. <laughs> it's been a year. I knew all Spike the, the football. Like, <laughs> yeah, just totally just danced around me and been like, finally. Or said something like, I've been wanting this or whatever. And those feelings may have existed. And we've talked about it a little bit. They, def- they definitely did. I was. How was it from your perspective? So. Because sometimes the the non-believing member of a mixed faith mm-hmm. marriage, this is like the day they've been dreaming of, right? Yeah. So I do have to say I'm very proud of my response because the, those were not the feelings that I was having. <laughs> um, so Tommy's brother and sister, we already covered, they left about a month before I did, but they left together. And watching them go through a faith crisis together as a married couple, I felt so jealous because they were being able to go and experience all these things. And they just, they had a built-in support system. And I came home and I, Tommy was very supportive, but to a certain degree, it wasn't like, oh yeah, you want to try alcohol let's go try alcohol together so that you know we can experience this new thing together whereas his brother and sister were doing that and I just yeah I was really jealous and so when Tommy said that he was ready to be done I I was happy but what was more important was that he was making a decision that he was confident in and was going to bring him happiness. And it wasn't just, oh, great, now we can go drink alcohol together. You know, even though I wanted to experience new life things together and that didn't happen because we did leave at different times, it was still important for me to ensure that he came to the conclusion on his own and I wasn't pressuring him to do it. So everything I have ever said about him leaving the church was I I treaded very lightly because I didn't want him to feel pressured into making a decision he wasn't ready to make. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you were cautiously happy for yeah. him, <laughs> but also wanting to be affirming. Yes. And of- also because I could see that the church was bringing him a lot of pain and it the church wasn't a happy thing for him closer to the end. And it just was a lot. He just had a lot of feelings about it that weren't good feelings. And so I was finally like, awesome. You can let this go. You can be happy. Even though like it's not always rainbows and butterflies now that we're both out. But it's much... I mean, I don't want to speak for you if you want to touch on this, but I finally felt like, okay, he can finally be happy because he no longer has this thing looming over his head. So, yeah. Yeah, and um, I know that there was a there was a mixture um, after I had um, left that, you know, made that decision to leave. Like I mentioned, there was that spiraling, all those feelings, but there was also a big uh, weight that was kind of lifted off my chest that I felt. Um, there, t- there was a there was an internal conflict, honestly, that started all the way back October twenty eighteen when my sister came out to me. That was just inside me at all times of like I believe this way, but the church teaches this way, and there's just this kind of I just picture it as like a. a boxing match just going on and it was draining and that was the cause of what you were saying of a lot of that pain was because I just I was ultimately I just wanted to do the right thing and I felt like I had two different right things and they were competing against each other and I just wanted to do one so I ultimately was like I'm either going to just decide right now to be Mormon forever and just exist in this space forever or leave for my sake and so I ended up deciding to leave and that was what month of this year? July. Okay. Yeah. Now here's here's a here's something that I've noticed a lot. 
I think about Katie Mount in this, you know, or, or Dan Witherspoon before, or Gina Colvin. When you've become a social media persona within a religious context, if you're known as the funny, faithful Mormon guy on TikTok, or if you're known as the believing spouse on Marriage on a Tightrope, or if you're known as John DeLynn, the guy who created a, you know, stay the S. Well, whatever it is, you like, even if you start having a major shift, then you're like, whoa, but if the stakes are higher, if I leave, or a blogger, a faithful blogger, Samantha, right? Because if I leave, it's not just me, it's all these people that were like liking my stuff, they were vibing with me, maybe I was even helping them find a way to stay, and that can, I don't know, maybe it can feel like pressure. Maybe it can make you feel like you're kind of locked in. Maybe it can make you feel like you're afraid to disappoint people. How was it for you? Yeah, so for me, my my favorite thing is hearing uh, from people that I would meet or they would just message me. Um, they were the thoughts of uh, my siblings and I uh, are mixed faith. Some have left, some have stayed. Um, and it's really hard for us to talk about church subjects or just the church in general, but we share your stuff with each other and we both laugh and that's like open doors to great conversations. Um, or just, it, there were scenarios where there, there was a mixed faith relationship, whether that was husband and wife, kids and parents or whatever it was, but people were telling me that they're using my content as a believing member to uh, build that bridge with someone that they didn't have a great relationship with. And so when I made this decision to leave, my f first thought when, in terms of just content, <clears throat> excuse me, or uh, and just the creator end of things, I thought, I think that is going to come to an end because um, I'm no longer faithful. So why, you know, why would any faithful person want to see this ex-Mormon talking about Mormon stuff. Um, that was my first thought. My second thought was, you know, the disappointment. Because um, I, you know, I had made friends kind of in the progressive Mormon world and realm, so we could just talk about this stuff. But now just another one that bites the dust of the progressive to ex-Mormon trail and, or whatever. So I was like, okay, so I'll probably lose them. Because that's they... the thing, because they, you, you, you want, my dad once told me, if you put a cold potato in with a bunch of hot potatoes, eventually, you know, no, what is it? If you put a hot potato amidst a bunch of cold potatoes, eventually the hot potato is going to become cold. Mm -hmm. And a progressive Mormon oftentimes may not want to hang around an ex-progressive Mormon mm -hmm. because it's maybe not good for the faith they're trying to cling to. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I thought all those friendships and connections were going to be gone. Um, and I just, and I, I had a huge fear that if I told people then I would lose every follower again, that's where my mind goes sometimes. And, and so and I, was I like, mean, that, so for some people they could be like, well, that's superficial. Oh, you're lose your, your social media followers. That's dumb. Like yeah. they, they might say that. Yeah. But, uh, which I understand, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but on the other end, uh, I've, been able to have some awesome conversations with people that I've never had or never probably would have had. Um, I also like doing it. Um, and uh, having followers makes that a reality, you know. And so, um, you know, I, I get the, you know, the superficial idea. But I was just, I just, I try to, I, I really, I, I wanted to be proven wrong that it didn't matter what my church membership was that like if I announced that I was leaving that people would still like the content um but that didn't end up being the case uh oh what happened um so so I decided honestly just kind of because I'm such a I, for this I was such a planner like I wrote out like what I was going to say about like why I'm leaving and all this stuff and then I decided just to do it on a whim. Like one person, I hosted like a little ask me whatever kind of thing. Someone asked if I was still active. And I just, I was like, you know what? I'm just doing this right now. I'm just going to tell everyone that I've left. And it was like maybe two days before I decided to leave. After. After. After, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, 
and so I I said that and um just I just kind of honestly watched like the followers immediately just kind of start going down. Like literally your your follower subscriber count starts to decrease. Uh yeah, like oh. that that night. Oh. Um but I'm, you know, I didn't know this at first, but at that same time, because I, I was talking to Madison, I told her, I think everyone is going to unfollow. If I wake up tomorrow and I have half of them, I will be happy. That was my mindset. Um, I, and so, yeah, we we're talking about this. Without talking uh, to me about it prior, Madison went to the um, Faith Meetup. Right? Faith Journeys Meetup. Faith Journey Meetup uh, Facebook group and just told them, like, hey, um, I've seen Aww. some of Tommy's uh, videos shared in here, so I, I know that some of you know him. Um, he's decided to leave. He's spooked about what the response is going to be. So if you feel so inclined to say something or go over there or whatever, let him know. And so, like, for a few minutes, I'm seeing this stuff decrease. The flip side happens, and I'm getting all these messages. Honestly, because, again, I didn't know. From random women, I'm like, <laughs> okay, where are they? You know, what's going on? I've just been like, you, like, you're awesome. We support you. We're happy that you are finding happiness. Your journey is yours, all this stuff. And uh, honestly, a lot of them started following. So by the next day, <laughs> I had more followers <laughs> than I did prior. And then Madison told me, she's like, just so you know, like, I did tell it. And I was like, okay, that makes a lot more sense. Um, I have to give a shout out to my friends, Chelsea and Nick Homer. We've had them on Mormon Stories, but the Faith Journeys Meetup group on Facebook. What's it at? 8,000? Yeah, I think it's at, I think it might be at 9,000 now. 9,000? Yeah. Yeah, 9,000 basically progressive, but mostly post Mormon women. Monthly activities, mm -hmm. supporting each other. If you are a post Mormon woman, especially if you're living along the Wasatch Front, yeah. but maybe not even limited to that, go to Facebook and join Faith Journey Meetups. It's a great group. And Nick and Chelsea, love you guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I do just want to add in there too. I think that they specifically say like women and non-binary individuals. Yeah, right. yes. And I, I, and I know that because I was like, Oh, I want to <laughs> join this group. And I, you know, yeah. I don't fit either. It's of a super, it's a super cool group. And I it, was jealous been, of Madison. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I talk about the group literally all the time. And it's been, it's been so helpful. Not, only in, because I joined it before I left. Oh, I just hit the microphone. Um, and it was very instrumental in helping me realize that you can be happy outside of the church. Because at the time, there was 4,000 people in the group. And I was like, I'm not ever going to be happy again. Cool. And then I joined this group, and there's 4,000 women who are having hard things in life, but they're able to say, but this happened and this happened and I'm so happy and I'm experiencing all these new things and it's, yeah, it's been really great. So. Yeah. Fun. And so, yeah. So, um, and, and, and so since then in the, in the months from July till now, um, just because of how social media works, people are still learning for the first time that I've left just, you know, days ago from today or whatever. Um, and I, you know, I also get comments of, just leave it alone. You've left. Blah 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 blah. Unoriginal. If you're gonna be mean or a troll, let's be original. Exactly. Put some creative juices in. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, I I understand. I like I had those same thoughts. You know, not too long ago. Like, just leave it alone. If you can't talk, you know, if you're if you don't believe in it, just whatever. Um, but you know, I I've I've landed in a place where, um, yeah, I think most people know. And I, I still make jokes, whatever, and I still have fun. Um, but yeah, I was very, very, very scared to tell people uh, to to just to see, you know, their rea reactions and whatever. And I felt a little silly, honestly, like well, you know, these strangers. I don't know them, um, but it still mattered to me. And I think there was another layer too. We were tr starting to try to monetize Tommy's social media accounts, and so there was not only fear of rejection but also maybe this is a full-time job isn't going to work out because you're going to tell people that you left the church and lose your following true but. yeah i i had been you know reached out to by some people or just had conversations with people where it was clear that if i stayed faithful or at least 
presenting as faithful, there probably would have been some perks to it. And I can't lie, I did consider that. Because I had honestly been kind of doing that for a while. So I was like, what's another year or two of self-hatred? Just kidding. Um, (laughs) But, you know, like, you know, if I can do it for a little bit more, then... Because honestly, the truth is, like, it, it was pretty positive. Like, I was in a really good spot. I was getting, you know, invited to things or whatever, and I was like, this is awesome. Because um, at some point, if you're like Al Caraway, is that her name? Like, if you can, uh, or Ty Mansfield, and this isn't a calling on anyone out in a negative way, but if you can position yourself as like a social media influencer who kind of knows all the problems but stays anyway, there's Deseret Book deals, yeah. you can be emceeing things, you can be invited to the red carpet parties of movie premieres. Like you can kind of, did I say desert book deals? Like you can yeah. slip into There's something that can actually be a, a living, yeah. right? Do that for a living. But I think that's what Al Car- Caraway does. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. She writes books for desert books and, and, and goes around the country yeah. touring. Um, and, and I guess Terrell and Fiona Givens are another version of this. And I'm not again, criticizing them because I'm becoming I'm, I'm, I've had a rebirth in terms of my feelings towards progressive Mormons. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they've, how many book deals have they had with Desert Book now? And, and they're flown all over the world to give firesides. And so, and that's, again, nothing wrong with that. But, you know, you, you kind of have to say goodbye to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you decide not to go that route. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was at a point where, like Madison was saying, some of those things were just starting to materialize. You were getting um, offers or? Um, there were talks about stuff, um, which was just exciting because, again, I had started this and yeah. I mean, I film all these videos like in our car or you know, our bedroom or whatever. So it's so small production, so it's easy, so simple. So to see that turn into something that could produce anything, I was excited about. Um, but ultimately, and this is just the honest truth, I just I had to uh, stay true to my integrity just, you know, I, I was done just associating with the church in any way. So I just, I just was like, I can't do that. Like, that seems like a, like a, a fantasy to be like, oh, I'll just kind of stay in the middle or whatever. I, at that point, it was just time for me, I felt, just to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Well, does that take us to today? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. It does. Yeah. So, so... I have at least two questions that Samantha, you may have a couple, but mine are number one. I want to hear from you both. Are you, do you feel like, like faith crisis can be tr- traumatizing. It can feel like you're tumbling. It can feel like a disaster, the dark night of the soul or whatever. Um, and then there's a question of, can you be happy and healthy outside of it? Where will you go? So where have you gone? And are either of you or both of you healthier and happier or not, or is it too early to say? And we'll have, um, uh, we'll have Madison go first. Perfect. Um, yeah, I definitely think at the beginning of my faith crisis, I was bawling my eyes out every day. I remember coming, we were on vacation in Portland, um, and we were with Tommy's siblings and I did not want to do anything. I had never been to Portland, but I was just like, I'm going through all these things. And, um, his brother and sister, sister sister-in-law were talking about them leaving the church. And I just did not want to be around those conversations like on our Portland trip. Cause I was like, I'm going to start crying. If I, if I hear anything about the church, I'm just going to start bawling, whether it's good or bad. I'm just going to cry my eyes out. And, So that definitely felt like a big, deep, dark hole that I was never going to get out of. Um, But I think just with time and allowing myself to have those emotions and not be ashamed that I'm that I'm going through a faith crisis was super important. And I am now I'm very happy now and healthier and I have healthier coping mechanisms and I don't feel dependent on anything. Like when I was a part of the church, I felt dependent on the church. I felt like I couldn't do anything unless I consulted my Bishop or read if I could do it in the book of Mormon, you know, and 
now I feel like I can make decisions for myself and I have so much more confidence in myself now that I am no longer a member and yeah, I'm much happier now. So, okay. Yeah. Um, to answer the first question about if a faith crisis can be, um, you know, traumatizing, uh, I would say absolutely. Um, for me, uh, it, it made me question everything, not just is coffee okay or not, but like, is God real or not? It went down to, uh, yeah, to, to everything I believed, uh, religiously, um, which in turn affected everything in my life. Cause I, you know, I viewed every action as something toward or, uh, toward God or not. And so, um, you know, going through a faith crisis, I'm very grateful. Like, you know, like I've mentioned, um, out of my family, I, you know, was fourth or fifth out of seven to go through this. I, I feel a lot of, um, uh, I, I feel for the people who are first. I don't know how that feels. And I can't imagine, you know, pr- you know, saying that to your faithful family, be like, I don't believe or whatnot. Um, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that I had not just siblings, but also a parent I could go to. And both parents. I want to, you know, my dad's active and believing and awesome with all of this stuff too. Mm. I just want to mention that as well. A, a great familial culture of uh, you are great as you are. Uh, we love you as you are, um, and that exists in our home. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I definitely, there was uh, the dark night of the soul. Uh, I felt like I was in that for a very long time. It was a long night mm-hmm. um, and very dark and just didn't really know where to go. Um, since I decided to leave, I've felt that light, some light come back. Um, it's not all back, you know, it's, you know, it's, you don't decide to leave and life is just like you said, rainbows and butterflies, it just everything's answered. Um, questions I, I always had answered now I don't have answers to them. Like, where do we go after this life? I had a perfect answer. One of these three kingdoms now, I don't know. So there's, you know, there's stuff where, um, there are, some questions that were answered that are now unanswered and that whole journey is one of its own. But overall, like I mentioned, kind of that internal conflict and that battle is gone and I'm so happy uh, that, that it is gone. Um, I, I'm in a place right now where I, I still consider myself religious in some capacity um, and I'm working through all that. And But it's great to come to conclusions myself um, and search for things and really feel like I have the whole permission to search, not search. And then this is the answer that you'll get or it's wrong. And from Satan, it's a true search of like discover what, you know, feels right for you and true to you. Um, So yeah, like you mentioned, or like, well, yeah, the time has been short um, since I decided to leave, but in that short amount of time um, that constant internal conflict has disappeared, which is great for all aspects of my life. Um, and I'm feeling what was kind of nervous and anxious about the future. I'm feeling excited. Um, yeah. And just anticipate a lot of learning and discovery and yeah, I'm looking forward to the future with excitement. You're, so you say the body count, there's (coughs) five, there's five empty, five out of seven empty chairs in your family now, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So five empty chairs um, when you started with no empty chairs. And that was like a family mantra. I'm curious. Well, number one, I feel a little bit sad for your dad. Like what would it be to be a a believing dad where his wife and four of his five children Mm -hmm. um, have left and now it's sad heaven for your dad. Um, But, you know, I'm wondering if, if your parents have ever thought, to pull the whole family together and say, Hey, you know, that no empty chairs thing, we're taking that out of the, of the family mission statement. We're killing no empty chairs. And now it's just love the moment or everyone's, everyone's together or whatever. I don't know what the replace mantra would be, 
But I'm wondering if that conversation ever happened. Uh, yes. So two things. One, I, I also, when I decided to leave my, one of my first thoughts was, um, I really don't want to tell my dad cause I think it's going to make him sad. And I don't know that answer if it made, you know, made him sad or not, but I made a very conscious decision to talk with him first, um, before I, you know, told everyone else, um, and we had a conversation about it. Um, but yeah, I, I empathize with him um, because for a while I, you know, was one of the three believing people or in, in some respect. Um, and so, yeah, we would have conversations about being the believers of the family and not in like a pompous way, but that's just kind of where we are. Um, with the whole no empty chairs thing, it's just interesting that you bring that up. Um, because we had that conversation just a couple days ago. What? Mm-hmm. Um, as a family? Uh, as a good chunk of a family. Okay. Those who have left. Mm. My mom reached out and asked us how we feel about that phrase. Oh, yeah. Um, and somewhere along the lines, especially when my uh, my sister uh, came out, um, for me, I, I was either forced to either just kind of throw that away or uh, reframe it. Um, and it's a it's a saying where it's spirit. I really enjoy the whole idea of just being together, and so I decided to reframe it into a. It's not no longer no empty chairs, celestial kingdom, top tier, family forever. We're you know that idea, but that is a family here on earth. All of you know this is all we know uh, will for sure happen. Taking this opportunity to live here with a whole no empty chairs mindset of we're all welcome. We're all, we're Johnsons. We are happy and proud to be in this family. We all love each other. There's, there's no closed doors. There's no empty chairs in that respect. So um, I know some of my siblings, again, in this conversation felt differently. um, And I understand that. Um, But for myself, that's kind of how I reframed it to, be a positive. Yeah. Boom. I love that. No empty chairs in our family right now, in the here and now. There are no empty chairs. We want everyone to feel loved and accepted regardless. What a great reframe, Samantha. Yeah. Do you have a do you have any questions or, you know, comments you wanted to make just as we're kind of wrapping up? Kind of putting you on the spot. Um, no. Okay. Not really. All right. All right. Well, what a beautiful story, and what an uplifting story. Thank you. Yeah, it, you know, we got there. Eventually. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there's no right answer. For yeah. some people, staying works, and that's okay, too. True, true. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, um, you know, we just celebrated our, our third year marriage anniversary uh, not too long ago, and it was just an opportunity to look back on the last three years to see how uh, it's all kind of changed where we're at now and just celebrate that and be happy with where we are. I love it. All right. Well, if people want to follow either of you or reach out, any, any final things you want to share? I I, I would love to double your, your audience <laughs> And Madison. I want to help you do whatever you want to do in oh, your life. Thanks. So, and, and the floor is yours to self promote, to shill for yourselves. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just on, Social media, I, I'm continuing to make videos and just have fun. It's at the Tomsters. T H E T O M S T E R S. Okay. Just a little fun little name I made up in high school and it's <laughs> stuck now. Do uh, you have a dream of like becoming a comedian someday or? I don't know. Right now, I mean, like I said, I'm figuring, trying to figure out a lot of stuff right now. So that'd have be you, awesome. I would love to make people laugh for a living. Have you done any collabs with, with Dan Bam Bam? Uh, not not officially okay. yet. Um, we need some collabs, right, Sam? Yeah, can I come to that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should all get together and just yeah. have fun. Um, but yeah, you know, let's all just be one big happy collaborating yeah. family. Hype House. I love. Yeah, there we go. Hypehouse.com. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, right. that's it for me. How about you? Um, I post a lot of pictures of my dog on Instagram. George, yes, George. Um, At madison.ashley, A-S-H-L-E-E. 
So if you want to see George, <laughs> follow me. Don't follow Tommy. He never posts pictures of George. So useless. All right, yeah, <laughs> that is my bad. That's that's yeah. the that's the one takeaway from today. Post yeah. more George. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, this, I know so many people are going to love this episode and they're going to be glad we did it. So thank you for your courage to come out and tell your story, your Mormon thank story. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for, for having us. Yeah. Awesome. Keep up the good work. And will you unblock me? I, I did. <laughs> oh, I'm yes, yes. <laughs> before we came here, he's in the car. Go to unblock him. Yeah, the moment, yeah, the moment before we stopped in. No, yeah. it was a couple weeks ago, then we talked. But yes, you are officially unblocked. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Whew, I'm relieved I can enjoy your, your comedy. Yeah. There you go. All right. And Samantha, I love plugging you because you do great work. So Zelf on the Shelf is an amazing YouTube channel. They also have a, a TikTok and Instagram channel. They've got a Patreon, so support Zelf on the Shelf. And also, Samantha, you are a life coach who uh, helps people in life transitions, in uh, finding health and happiness. And do you mind plugging your website really quick for me? Yeah, Samantha Shelley Coaching dot com. Shelley is E Y. Yeah. All right. And we remind me to make sure to include that in the show notes as well. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, of course. Thanks for being my co pilot for today. I Yeah. It's always great to have you it's when you can come. Been really good. You two are lovely people. I've really enjoyed thank listening you. to you both. Well, thank you thank very you. much. All right. Thanks, guys. And thank you for joining us today on Mormon Stories. It's uh, been a pleasure. Uh we love and uh, require support as well to keep all this going. We pay Samantha, we pay all our staff uh, and try to do it as generously as we can. So if you are a monthly donor or a donor, thank you. If you're not, we're always losing donors. We lost, lost three donors this morning and we always need to replace the donors we lose. So if you want to become a monthly supporter and support content like this, you can go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button at the top right of the page, become a monthly donor. All our donations, all your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. Um, we're transparent in our finances, and every dollar we spend goes towards trying to support people um, in their Mormon journeys uh, in or leaving the church. Um, so please support us if you can. Of course, following us on Facebook, uh, TikTok, Instagram, um, you know, YouTube, wherever you can. Our YouTube channel is growing at like 2,500 subscribers a month, and we're going to hit uh, 100,000 within a year, year and a half. So, you know, please follow us and support us. Share our links wherever you can and spread the word. Please share this episode with anyone who you think might be, uh, might value from it. And we love your feedback. So email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Feel free to comment on any of the different platforms. That helps the algor algorithms as well. But if you've got great ideas of uh, guests we can bring on, guests that will really reach our audience, we want to hear about it and other ideas as well. So thanks for your support. Be kind to each other. Be good to each other. Love each other. Uh, have more comedy and fun in your life. Enjoy <laughs> the life you have because it's the only one you know you have for sure. And we'll see you all again on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.